beautiful fall afternoon. We're on the campus of Wofford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The University of New Hampshire is making their ninth consecutive appearance in the FCS playoffs. Eric Reitenstein leads a potent offensive attack for Wofford, who are making their fifth playoff appearance in the last six years. It's the NCAA FCS playoffs. New Hampshire and Wofford coming up next. This afternoon, we welcome you inside Gibbs Stadium in Spartanburg, South Carolina, the home of the uh, Terriers of Wofford out of the Southern Conference as they take on New Hampshire out of the Colonial Athletic Association. And the winner of this game today will take on the winner of the North Dakota State, South Dakota State game. Hi, everybody, along with Rocky Boyman, former Notre Dame and NFL linebacker. I'm Mike Gleason. It's always great to have you with us. It's playoff time, Rock, and college football fans are always screaming about the playoffs. Here in the FCS, this is legitimate playoff time. The winner will have to play four, maybe five games for a national championship. Well, you're right. The FCS is known for a long time what college football fans want, and that is a playoff for, to decide which team is the best. Not voters, not computers. We're going to decide here on the field. And this afternoon, we have two of the marquee players in FCS, one on the offensive side, one on the defensive side. Yeah, this really is the unstoppable force versus the immovable object right there. Eric Breitenstein, second leading rusher in FCS football. A real between-the-tackles guy, but has great vision, breaks a lot of tackles, and is deceptively fast. And a guy he'll be facing a lot here today is New Hampshire linebacker Matt Evans. You see right there, 449 career tackles. He's a sideline to sideline type guy. Expect a lot of big time collisions between these two marquee players. One of these teams will slide into the quarterfinals next week. Couldn't ask for a better day. Temperatures in the 70s. Sunny blue skies. We'll be back with the kickoff right after this. Go! Division I student athletes have higher SAT and ACT scores than college bound students. The number of us receiving diplomas is at an all-time high. African-American males who are student athletes are 10% more likely to graduate. Still think we're just a bunch of dumb jocks? You need to do your homework. There are over 400,000 NCAA student athletes, and just about all of us will be going pro in something other than sports. Welcome back to Spartanburg, New Hampshire, and Wofford. The Wildcats will take the football first. And right now, let's welcome in the third member of our broadcast team. Here's Ron Tina McCann. I just now spoke with the Wildcats offensive coordinator, Ryan Cardi. They are going with Sean Goldridge as their starting quarterback. He and Andy Bayless have shared this position all season long, partly because of injury, but also because it just works. They are both dual threat quarterbacks. They have nearly identical passing numbers and, of course, run the ball. Even though Goldridge got the start, expect to see number 14's number called this afternoon, guys. All right, thanks a lot, Ron Tina. We'll talk more about this as it, uh, the game develops as we take a look at Sean McDonald in his 14th year. And, of course, as we said at the top of the broadcast, his ninth straight trip into the FCS postseason. And no other team has done that. Mike Ayers in his 25th year as the uh, head coach of Wofford, and he is the winningest coach in school history. And right now, Casey Redfern, a junior from Jamestown, North Carolina, all set to uh, kick this off. Jared Allison and Nico Scaretti back to receive for the Wildcats. Scaretti takes it halfway into the end zone, and they decide to take it at the 25-yard line. Well, Rocky, our first look at the first quarterback, that's number five, Sean Goldrich. Yeah, this really is a two-platoon style team right here. We'll see Goldrich here to start, but then Valis will get some action too. And, and we are talking to coaches here this week, it's, you know, they went with Goldrich to open the season, but then he had an injury early on, and Valis came on and really set the world on fire. So he said, look, let's try to get our best 11 players on the football field, and uh, I think we'll see both quarterbacks here today a lot. And neither Sean McDonald or Ryan Carter, the offensive coordinator, have ever worked with a two-quarterback system before. 
But they say, you know, the locker room, there's no favorites. It doesn't matter who's in there. They're both very productive. And they're all set now for the first play from scrimmage here. Winner goes on to the quarterfinals. Uh, first play starts at the 25-yard line. And the redshirt freshman quarterback, Sean Goldrich, didn't like what he saw. There was some miscommunication, and there was a penalty flight. Yeah, but that's one of those inexcusable things. Usually your first play of the game is a scripted play, and, and I know they may have come out with a different look there, but he's got to find a way to get that play off because, again, usually the first 10, 15 plays are scripted. There's our referee today, Jerry uh, Magalanis. And now both teams uh, talking things over with their coaches. So a very awkward start to this uh, football game here in the second round of the FCF playoffs. So we'll keep it right here. And uh, Rocky, let's take a look at uh, some impact players of this game. Well, absolutely. You know, both teams got some great players. You see right there for New Hampshire, Nico Steridi. He is a big time running back, a, a dual threat running back team as well. But uh, but he's second in, in, the, in the Colonial Athletic Association in rushing. And you see right there, R.J. Harris. We talked to the coaches yesterday. He's as dynamic of a player playmaker they have had on this team in a long time. And on defense, we talked about Evans, but Allen Busby's a big time sideline to sideline linebacker as well. Harris just 19 yards away from 1,000. Goldrich, the redshirt freshman, ready to go to work now. This will be the first play. And Goldrich uh, keeps it on the left side, and he is driven down to the turf, uh, and he's driven down hard. Not too uh, much to go there with John Roseboro trying to get by a big number 90. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, this defensive front for Wofford is really dynamic. A lot of big-time playmakers up there, really stout. Rosenboro will call his name a lot, and the other end, Tarek Odom is a big-time player as well. Another guy we're going to be calling a lot here today. Out of the shotgun. Goldrich has his man, and coming up very quickly is uh, Stefan Shelton, the cornerback, a very astute defensive player. He really is. I'll tell you what, Shelton right there and the other corner, Blake Wiley, both these are very aggressive, well-tackling cornerbacks, and they really rely on these guys and make a lot of plays. Third down and six, they're 50% on converting third downs this year. Penalty flags drop. And it looked like some movement early in the backfield. Uh, Chris Sedian, the junior. Prior to the snap, full start on the offense. Five yards, third down. He started backing up and tried to swerve out to the uh, flats, and he did it a little bit early. Yeah, I'll tell you what, this is not the way New Hampshire would like to start this game. You, you have to think, uh, you know, Wofford is, is definitely the team with the advantage here today, and coming in on their turf, got to find a way to start a little bit better. Third down. First possession of the ball game. Goldrich goes upstairs, and this one is almost picked off. Boy, Blake Wiley, the uh, senior from Fort Mill, South Carolina, thought he had it, and if he would have pulled it in, it would have been his third. And Goldrich just got introduced to Alvin Sino, a big-time playmaker right there. Took from one right under the chin right there by Goldrich. Sino is, a, again, a great player. really come on, kind of battled some injuries early in this season, but uh, he's a third leading tackler on the team. He's a leader in sacks with five. He can really get after the quarterback. Mike MacArthur, the junior from Northampton, New Jersey, on to punt from his 10-yard line. Brad Nosek standing back at his own uh, 35. And Nosek comes back to about the 36, and he has nowhere to go. Good coverage by the Wildcat punt coverage team. And now he somehow slipped out. Yeah, I think they're going to call him down back there, but <laughs> some good running nonetheless. Wow. There was a scrum going on back at the 36-yard line, and suddenly Nosek came out of nowhere up to the midfield stripe. Yeah, we'll see. He feels his punt right here, and we'll see if he, in fact, did go down. No, I didn't see his he knee didn't. touch. He, he, he didn't. He didn't go down at all right there. He just kept right on running. Well, unless there was a whistle, the fans here at Wofford did not like that call. Right. Yeah, and that's the question right there, whether the, it looks like, in fact, the referees did blow the whistle, and Wofford fans are upset about that, and rightfully so. So the Terriers force a punt on the first possession. Now they will start working at the 37-yard uh, line. James Lawson opens up the game, the sophomore from Pickens, South Carolina. Usually it's Brian Cass, and there's that running game now up just shy of the 40-yard line. Yeah, anyone who knows what Wofford, Wofford runs, they are a triple option team. A lot of real high up-tempo team, but they also, not, they're not just triple option. We'll see some trap option. We'll see some power, a lot of different looks, and they got a lot of running backs that can tote the rock, too. Well, Donovan Johnson, the junior from McDonough, Georgia, gets the first call. He picks up a couple, so it's second and eight now on their first possession. 
Here's the pitch outside. Breitenstein is smothered at the 40-yard line. Boy, good gang tackling uh, by the Wildcats. It really is so far in the first two plays here. The Wildcats doing a great job against this uh, proficient running attack here. And, and again, if you're just now tuning into this game, Wofford likes to run the football. They've never passed more than eight times in any one game. So they are going to pound it out on the ground. That's why they are the second leading rushing team in FCS right now. On average, uh, about 6.8 passes a game, 59 plus running the football. And they face their first third down. Breitenstein up over the 45. Had to get to the 47 for the first down. He's going to be about a yard shy. It's going to bring up a fourth down for the Terriers. And we see right there, Breitenstein up the middle. He gets up the ball on the outside on the pitch. They find a way to get the ball to both him and Donovan Johnson. They're the two workhorses for this Walker running attack. Well, fourth down, first <laughs> possession. They're still in their own territory, and Mike Ayers decides he wants to go for it. And most option teams, they are a four down team. We see they've run gone forward on fourth down 17 times this year, so this is not a big surprise. And they've converted 10 times for a 59 percentage rate, and they've got it this time. There he goes, Breitenstein. Touchdown. That's his career, number 63. And with that run, Rocky, he moves up to number two all time in the Southern Conference. And, and a great call to go for on fourth down right there. And just a great call right here. Look, takes the ball to the middle, breaks one tackle the line of scrimmage. But other than that, no one touches him. You got to wonder where the second line of defense for New Hampshire was. Looked like they were really trying to crowd that line of scrimmage like defenses like to do on four, third and fourth down and short. But no one was at the second level, and Breitenstein just took it to the house. Casey Redfern on for the extra points. It's true. And just like that, the Terriers on their first possession of the second round game. Fourth down play. Mr. Breitenstein, it's pretty bright on this play, takes it into the house. 7 nothing. Eleven fifty-one to go in the opening quarter. Seven nothing. Wofford on top, thanks to the uh, the running prowess of number seven there, Eric Breitenstein. You see his numbers there, five thousand four hundred and eight. And with that run, he just moved up to number two all time in the Southern Conference. Number one, of course, is Adrian Peterson. He's got a long way to go to catch him. He had 6,559, but what a career number seven's had. And Breitenstein's one of those guys we were talking to the coaches and players yesterday. He does everything perfect. You, you want to think, does he have a messy room or something? They say no. <laughs> he actually keeps his room real neat, too. So uh, just uh, the epitome of the kind of player you want if you're a head coach. Breitenstein really gets the job done. And uh, Breitenstein also with 63 rushing touchdowns now. That's only fifth. He's one more from taking over the fourth spot. Armani Edwards of Appalachian State, uh, he's third with 65. And again, it's Adrian Peterson with 84. And Breitenstein, again, is one of the Walter Payton finalists, one of three here for this year. So he has a chance to take home that big time trophy. Redford ready to kick off again. His second kickoff already this afternoon. Nico Scaretti 
Jared Allison, the deep man uh, for the Wildcats of New Hampshire. And it's another good kick by Redfern. And Storetti for the second time will take a knee. And for the second time, New Hampshire will start at the 25 yard line. Yeah, and New Hampshire's got to find a way to get back in this game. When you're facing the, an, op an option team, the last thing you want to do is get behind because they're a ball control team. And you see right there, Mike Ayers, he is no, his whole career has run that triple option. Loves to control the game on the ground. He's done it well for a long time. Mike Ayers, like yourself, a former linebacker, like yourself from Cincinnati. But you know what the... Uh, <laughs> he is a, a black belt in karate, go. right? And, and I'm not even... That, what's the lowest belt? I don't even know, <laughs> but I couldn't even touch that. So Isn't it white? I'll, stay, no? away, <laughs> I'll stay away from Mike Ayers in a <laughs> physical confrontation. <laughs> Second possession now for the Wildcats. And they're going to keep it on the ground uh, to no avail. Hit the line of scrimmage. And there's nowhere to go. Storetti gets the call. And what about the New Hampshire game plan right now, Rock? Well, for New Hampshire, they got to win on first down defensively, which they did in that last series. They forced some second and longs, but but then obviously gave it up uh, the long run there on fourth down. So they really got to do a better job of that, especially, again, against this ball control type offense. And, and also, I think one of those two quarterbacks, either Goldridge or Ballas, really need to step up and be the guy. It can't be just a two-platoon system. One of them need to be dynamic today. Goldridge fires over the middle. This one's complete to R.J. Harris, and Harris picks up about four, but again, he's met immediately. And uh, usually that's Mike Nyan there, the inside linebacker making the stop. But uh, Harris is known for his yards after the catch. Yeah, he really is. And again, he's, you know, we saw him running around yesterday, real long legged guy out there, has some good hips and a very fast guy. They got to try to find a way to get him the ball inside, outside, down the field, get in his hands. Trips to the bottom of your screen, five wideouts altogether. This one's complete over the middle. And it's going to be a first down for the Wildcats. It's their first first down as Joey Orlando gets his 165th career reception as he moves into the uh, sixth spot all time at New Hampshire. And Goldrich already he's just feeling the pressure all day by these this front seven here, the front four especially of Wofford. They can really get after the quarterback and cause a lot of problems. First down trips to the bottom of your screen for Goldrich. Comes out in the flat. It's Harris. Harris looking for the block. He's up over the 40-yard line, stopped at the 42, and he's brought down. And, and that's what they're going to have to do right now. Is instead, They can't just afford to drop back and, and wait and seven-step, five-step drops. They get the ball out of the hands versus that rush up front. So I like that play right there. Get it out of the hands quick. Get it in the hands of your receivers and let them break some tackles. Philip Legrand made that last tackle, and look at that defensive play. Wow, Blake Wiley, that's the second time he's been all over the receiver, and he wasn't quite sure if he wanted to pick six or if he wanted to lay some wood. Yeah, and right there, Wiley did a great job, but Joey Orlando missed the block. That's what happened right there. You see, he tried to get the block, and he just ran right by that. Wiley did and had a big-time dynamic play right there, first portion of the third and long. Great play. Third down and about eight yards to go. Out of the shotgun, and he's going down. That is sacked at number 21 for the Terriers this year. And he was blown dead. Then it's going to bring up another punting situation. Right? And that was Alvin Sciano again. This kid is a fast off the edge, but that right there looks like he came underneath. And the thing about Wofford is they don't have to blitz a lot because they can just rush four because they got guys that can get after the quarterback and they can just leave the rest of the guys in coverage. But Sciano again right there, six foot two, 215 pounds. Just a great player versus South Carolina a couple weeks ago. He had 12 tackles, an interception, the ruling and a on the field fumble. Over progress was stopped. Fourth down. So the Wildcats will have to punt it again. Uh, you mentioned uh, CNO. He's only a junior, too, out of Louisiana. Came in with 59 tackles, five sacks, a couple of forced fumbles, a fumble recovery, and that pick you talked about. So some pretty impressive numbers for the junior linebacker as Mike MacArthur will be punting this time from about the 17-yard line. Nosek is standing back at the 25. Nosek calls for the fair catch, and they'll start this one just about the same place the last one started. But the last time they scored on a 52-yard run by Breitenstein. Second possession for the Terriers coming up.
Wofford about to start their second possession from the 37 as we check in with Rontino. Just like New Hampshire, Wofford has had some injuries at quarterback, so Brian Cass has been hurt this season. He did not get the start. He will play, but we will see James Lawson and Michael Weimer rotate in as well. They want to keep Cass as fresh as possible as they make their playoff run. Well, thank you, Rontina. That's good intel because uh, that first possession, I was kind of confused why Cass wasn't in there. Cass, a redshirt junior. Lawson, a sophomore, and uh, Weimer, a redshirt freshman. Yeah, all three of those guys uh, can get the job done. Weimer, especially, he's a six foot five freshman, good looking kid. He had a 73 yard run for a touchdown earlier in the season. So, uh, you know, next man up. It's kind of the motto these coaches always have. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Terriers start from the 37 yard line. Lawson, about a 58% passer, although, as Rocky said, you're not going to see a lot of passes. You're going to see number seven. Just like that, carry the ball a lot. His uh, biggest game this year, Rocky, 321 yards. That is a lot, a lot of <laughs> yards on the ground, and they do it very, very well. We talked to this New Hampshire team. They were happy they got that extra bye week, so they had extra time to you know, practice against this Wofford triple action rushing attack. It's one of those hard things because you don't see it a lot. When you do, it happens so very fast. Picked up three, so it's second and seven. They keep it on the ground again. Uh, this is Johnson, the junior out of Georgia. And you look at the size of Wofford and uh, the distribution of scholarships. Mike Ayers, he goes uh, recently, he had 33 recruits and from 12 different states. So there's a lot of diversity there. Yeah, and give him a lot of credit for being able to go down the road and get these guys to come to this place. But what a great place to come, right? Great facilities, uh, great football stadium here. This is a good place to come. So now the Terriers face a third down. There's the pitch to the outside, and it's going to be a first down for Wofford. To it right there, you already see them linemen getting the second level, chopping guys down, cutting them. It's so hard to play this style of offense right here, and Wofford already has a lot of momentum. But we see New Hampshire trying to stack that box. They only go with a high single safety deep, trying to get that eighth man in the box which is usually Trey Williams, Manny Asim, Nick Cefalo. Those safeties are especially going to have to have a big game today. Breitenstein breaks to the outside. He's inside the 35-yard line. Mike Ayer is saying he only runs to maybe a 4-6, but he has great vision, knows where the hole's going to be. Great vision. If you're a fullback in a triple option attack, you've got to have that. He definitely does. And see right there, they ran a little trap option right there. They pulled the left guard, kicked out the defensive line, and, and again, he just finds the hole. Simple as that. Eric Breidenstein, again, just gets it done. Just a football playing dude, man. Went over 100 yards every game, but one this year. The Offensive Player of the Year, back-to-back -back seasons in the Southern Conference. Uh, he was the preseason Offensive Player of the Year both years, so he backed it up both times. Johnson, Johnson finds a hole this time, and Johnson's down near the 20-yard line, dragged down at the 21-yard uh, line. Hayden Nutson, the freshman from Alexandria, Virginia, finally got his arms on him. And I'll tell you one thing New Hampshire's doing, I'm kind of questioning right now, is they got six guys on the line of scrimmage right there. You see four down line and two outside linebackers, but it's the second level where they're getting burned right now. So I think they need to stack that extra guy inside the box. Once he gets through past that line of scrimmage, they have another tackle and they're able to bring him down. Breitenstein again inside the 20. Penalty flag drops at the end of the play. The yellow and the carry, holding tackle by number 77, 77 the can. 10 yard penalty, first down. That's going to be another first down for Wofford. That's 77. Yeah. So it uh, goes against uh, Jake Miles, the senior from Charlottesville, Virginia. And this team doesn't get penalized very often either, uh, Rocky. Less than five penalties a game for only about 36, 36 and a half yards a contest. Yeah, they only got 48 penalties on the year coming into this game compared to New Hampshire who has 62. So a very well-disciplined team. They don't beat themselves. Out of the shotgun, first and 20, Johnson. First man through, and he's inside the 25, down to about the 24-yard line. You know, Rocky, you've got Donovan Johnson. You've got Breitenstein. I mean, you've got running backs all over your board, and I noticed number 22, Ray Smith, a true freshman from Spartanburg. 
He's been in there on a couple of plays here early. Well, and that's what's important. They have six running backs that have over 200 yards rushing, including the quarterbacks. So again, you can all, they're always bringing in fresh legs, always have a fresh body, and that's very uh, a tough thing for a defense to face, those fresh guys all the time. And this time the quarterback uh, keeps it lost. Falls on the ground. And New Hampshire says they have it, uh, but the official, the line judge says no, he was down. And so the possession will remain with Wofford. By New Hampshire. Well, New Hampshire half. does have it. So the Wildcats uh, get the first break as far as turnovers. And Wofford, they've only turned it over 11 times coming in, but three fumbles against South Carolina. They did, and they were in that game versus South Carolina until they put the ball on the ground three times, like you just said. But New Hampshire desperately needed that right there. We'll see exactly what happened. I want to say it was Evans. Yeah, right there. The big-time playmaking linebacker, Mike Evans, with a big-time play, get New Hampshire back in this game. Wildcats get the football. They're now plus eight in turnover margin, but they trail here in Spartanburg by seven. Wofford on top, 7-0, but Rocky, uh, they turn it over. Only 12 turnovers, but four now in the last two games. And you're absolutely right. They lead the Southern Conference in turnover margin, but right there you see Matt Evans, a big-time playmaking linebacker we talked about at the opening of the game. Gets a left hand in right there, stripping the ball in a great play right there, getting a turnover in the red zone. That's one thing Coach McDonald talked about for New Hampshire is, you know, with, you know, Matt Evans, a great linebacker, lots of tackles, but has been missing some of those big plays this year compared to 2011. But right there in this playoff game, gets a big time play, gets their offense back to football. And Brontina told us at the top of the broadcast, we'd see both quarterbacks. There's Andy Bayless, the sophomore from Bedford, New Hampshire, getting his first snap, and he fumbled a snap. Not a good start uh, for Andy Bayless. And uh, you talked about both quarterbacks uh, pretty even. Uh, Goldrich about 59%, Bayless 58%. But Bayless has 18 touchdowns and just three INTs. Yeah, he, if you had to say one was more the runner or who's the more the passer, you'd say Bayless is a bit more the runner. He opened up the Townsend game with a 77-yard rushing touchdown. So we'll see if that's more the game plan with him in. Play action, Bayless comes out firing, has his man wide open at the 40-yard line. And he's all the way up to the 45, and Joey Orlando has his second catch. That's a great job by Joey Orlando up the sideline right there. He's the second leading receiver on this football team. Finally got a good exchange. Looks like they were playing some zone defense. He got over top of the corner and just underneath the safety right there. Broke a tackle. Wofford up close to the 50-yard line. Bayless goes back to work. Fires near side at the 49. It hit the ground. And it falls uh, incomplete. 
So the intended receiver was Justin Mello, the junior from Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Working out of the shotgun, Goldrich back in at quarterback. He's scrambling back at the 30. And he fires. Nice catch at the 45 if he holds on. They're going to say he was out of bounds. That was just a good job by Bayless right there keeping that play alive. Looked like he was going to get sacked for a big loss, but credit him for moving to his left, getting outside the pocket. Actually, looks like they're not going to give him a catch on that play right there. Now he ran out of real estate, yeah. uh, so it's going to be third and ten. Inside five minutes of the first quarter now, the Wildcats have the ball at the 45 of their own territory. Goldrich has nowhere to go, and he's going down. He fumbled the football. And uh, Mike Kosha, the sophomore center, jumped on it. And it's a good thing, too. Uh, keep in mind that Goldrich is a redshirt freshman. Probably should have tucked it. Yeah, definitely should have tucked that ball right there. But I again, I question the call. They ran four verticals, which is a deep developing route right there. And again, against this Wofford defensive front who gets after the quarterback, I think you've got to go get the ball out of your hands a little bit faster, which I know is tough on third and 10. But uh, again, I don't think they're going to have much luck trying to go to a five and a seven step drop today. Well, MacArthur standing at the 25. Brad Nosick now back at his uh, 23. It's a low spiral kick, and Nosick goes all the way back to the 10-yard line. He loses possession, and he jumps on it at the 9. So a decent field position, back-to-back uh, -back possessions. Now they'll start from the 9-yard line. 2012 NCAA Division I Championship continues next weekend. Quarterfinal games on December 8th. All games will be on the ESPN Family of Networks. For more information, go to NCAA.com, the official online home for all 89 NCAA championships. Okay, looks like we're going to get a look at this play again right here. You know, it looked like the ball went a little bit deeper than he wanted to. You, you'd like to think you want to get back on that ball and then turn around and try to catch it right there. But fortunately for Wofford, they were to at least get on top of that, on top of that football. Lawson stays at quarterback despite the fumble, and they've got some running room again all the way up to the 25, and I can feel for the Wildcat defense because I thought it was the first man that had the ball. And it's these linebackers that this is the toughest thing I know because I've played against some triple option teams with the Naval Academies I used to face at Notre Dame. It's really a vision problem. You just don't know who's getting the ball. It's gonna, is it the dive? Is it the quarterback? Is it the pitch? And when they run this triple option with the efficiency that they do, it's so hard for those guys to see. That was 39. Nosek uh, was 19th carry this year. He's averaging almost seven and a half yards a game. And there's the guy who just can break the game wide open. Breitenstein again all the way up over the 45 to about the 48-yard line. And again, with so much of that motion going on, the quarterback coming, the pitch man, sometimes you forget about that dive. But they've got to find a way to stop Eric Breitenstein right there. Again, they pull the left guard right there. And again, he just breaks a few tackles. Nothing exceptionally pretty about that run right there except for the result. Well, Wofford uh, closing out the season with back-to-back -back overtime games and then lost to South Carolina after that game was tied at seven in the fourth quarter. No problem so far getting that offense uh, hitting fifth gear. They're at the midfield stripe now as Nosek gets the call again. I was going to ask you if you missed your plan days, but uh, a day like this when you don't know who has the football, <laughs> it's probably better to be in the booth. Right? You don't. I even asked uh, the New Hampshire coach, uh, Sean McDonald, this week, did you guys do the practice without the football thing? And he said, yeah, because when you play these guys, everybody's got to be on their assignment. Who has a dive? Who has a quarterback? Who has a pitch? And it gives you absolute fits back there. Fumble loose on the ground all the way back at the 40. A little miscommunication with the snap. And uh, speaking of that, Rocky, you know, the uh, defensive coordinator, John Lyons, uh, most defensive coordinators say it's hard to simulate that in practice. Said it's not so much the simulation as we take another look at this one, but it's the speed of that offensive line, how they come off the ball. Yeah, it really is. But right there, you see just with the, the snap, just a little bit low going between his legs. But uh, like you said, it's just so hard to simulate in practice, the speed, especially at Wofford. I'm really impressed with how fast they get that pitch out there. They know when that quarterback reads, whoever it is, when he reads that pitch is going outside, boom, that thing's gone out of his hand. Nosek, he has it. It's third and 18. He's up uh, back to the original line of scrimmage, but that'll bring up a, another punting situation for Wofford. 
And again, just a lot of success up the middle. I'll tell you what, if, I, if I'm New Hampshire's defensive coach right now, John Lyons, I'm saying, let them pitch the ball outside. We're not going to sit here and let them run it up the gut on us. There's nothing more demoralizing for a defense than getting run up the middle on you. So uh, look to maybe try to remedy that here next series. Redfern punting. At about the 37. High punts. And the fair catch is called for inside the 10-yard line. <laughs> and Jared Allison, the redshirt freshman, had it. He dropped it, but a good thing he jumped on top of it. You're right. You can see these teams have had a week off here because just some of the football fundamentals things, the snap, the exchange, catching uh, the punts are just a little bit off right now. These teams need to get back in sync. So the Wildcats have possession of the ball, trailing by a touchdown. You see North Dakota State they're looking to repeat. Uh, the winner of this game will take on the winner of that North Dakota State, South Dakota State game. And how about Appalachian State? I'm huh? making their 20th career appearance. Yeah, they've been in for a long time right there. And you see, again, defense ruling the day here. Four of the nation's top six defenses are still in this playoff here. Speaking of defense, more after this play in the Southern Conference. Uh, here's some razzle-dazzle now, and it's uh, the end of round. And up over the 15-yard uh, line. So a nice uh, pickup that time. And it's uh, Sturridi. Already get, actually getting the call out of the backfield. And uh, he brings it up uh, close uh, to the first down. But defensively, you look at Appalachian State's Wofford and Georgia Southern. Three way tie, Southern Conference. Defense, Georgia Southern's defense was the tiebreaker. They gave up 165 points or 164. Wofford gave up 165. That's how tight it was. <laughs> That's how close it is in this FCS. Goldrich play action down the middle. Harris has it at the 40. R.J. Harris, the sophomore out of Maryland, big time receiver. That was a nice job. He came from the from the right side of the field right there with the he rolled out to his left. Look at the athleticism right there, jumping up, catching that football out of the air. Again, you need to find a way to get him the football, whether it's handing it to him, throwing it to him. Any way you can get in his hands, R.J. Harris is a force out there. And he just became the fifth receiver at New Hampshire to go over 1,000. There's Harris again. And the penalty flag dropped right after they pushed him out of bounds at about the 41-yard line. It may have been defensive interference right there on R.J. Harris on the corner. Yeah, either that or he might have stepped out of bounds and came back in. The ruling on the field. Number 15 of the offense stepped out of bounds on his own, came back in and caught the pass. That's loss of down, correction, illegal touching, loss of down at the line of scrimmage will be second down. Good the call. quarter will be extended, one play. Good call, Rocky. Of course, if he's forced out of bounds, he can come back in, but that wasn't the case. Right, and you can touch the ball. You just cannot be the first player to touch the ball once you go out of bounds. But credit right there, the... The cornerback right there, I think it was Shelton right there, did a nice jam, just kind of got him off his spot a little bit, and then looked like his left foot went out of bounds right there. It's a shame because they really had a nice play right there. Looked like it was covered too, and he got over top of the cornerback and right underneath the safety. That's exactly where he should have went with that football. Got to find a way to stay in bounds. I'm sure, Ryan Carter, the offensive coordinator, happy to see Harris getting involved early though, as Bayless is back on the field and he rumbles to the midfield stripe. And it looks like he's going to pick up a first down on the very final play of the first quarter. So we played 15 minutes. The only score so far. Who else? Eric Breitenstein. 52 yards. His 63rd touchdown of his career. 7 up and Wofford on top. NCAA.com slash shop has all the hottest officially licensed 2012 championship merchandise. With over 100,000 items for over 500 college teams, everything you need is in one location. You'll get 365-day hassle-free returns, great customer service, and $4.99 three-day shipping on any size order. Remember, for all your college gear, head to NCAA.com slash shop.
Well, the winner of this uh, football game will take on the winner of that North Dakota State, South Dakota State game. North Dakota State, the defending national champs. Yeah, and look, Georgia Southern right there taking on Central Arkansas. Georgia Southern with a number one ranked rushing offense, 392 yards per game. They're the only team better than Wofford taking on that Central Arkansas team who's led by Windrick Smothers. Looking forward to seeing Old Dominion play. They have a sophomore quarterback by the name of Taylor Heineke against New Hampshire in a 64-61 victory. He passed for 730 yards. And unfortunately, New Hampshire's going to have their name in the record books. That He was the most total yards in any football conference, FBS or FCS, 791 in that game. First play of the second quarter for the Wildcats, trailing by seven. Goldrich back at quarterback. Steretti gets the call, breaks outside, and he has another first down for the Wildcats. Knew exactly where that marker was, went out of bounds. And that was a smart move right there. I think the, the heart and soul of this defense is up the middle, so they can find a way to bounce this thing outside. What a great decision. You saw with a vision right there, and then breaks a tackle with a stiff arm. That's a nice job, a nice run by Stradi right there. Goldrich. Well, he didn't get the first down. Goldrich does on the quarterback sneak. Gives me a second. Now, you talked about this at the top of the broadcast, but this is how tight that quarterback race is. Goldrich won the job in camp. First game of the season, named the CA Rookie of the Week, threw a couple of touchdown passes. As he completes the ball right there, again, it's uh, Orlando. He's down to the 30-yard line, but gets dinged up on the second play of the second game. Bales comes in, throws five touchdowns. Then he's named the CAA Offensive Player of the Week. The following week, he threw for two more touchdowns and 315 yards. Goldrich comes back, and again, he wins Rookie of the Week with four <laughs> touchdowns against Maine, and they've been trading ever since. That's, that's a good problem to have, I guess, if you're a quarterback or if, if you're a coach. Back and forth, back and forth, and Goldrich has the job right now. Steretti has the ball. He's up close to another first down. It looks like uh, New Hampshire is starting to settle down. Yeah, they really are. They kind of went with the up-tempo here a little bit, uh, which is a little bit uncharacteristic for them. They're trying to get to that line, try to keep that Wofford defense on their heels a little bit. I like the call. Looks like he just picked up the first down, so they're moving the chain, so it's another, another first down for the Wildcats. And uh, you talked about the fact they have 471 yards of offense, but what great balance, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Coming in this game, 234 on the ground, 237 in the air. That's about as balanced as you can get. It doesn't get much closer than that. Goldrich, shot of the gun, fumble the football. And again, the Terriers have it. It's like big number 97, E.J. Speller, the redshirt freshman from Chesapeake, Virginia. Gets his third fumble recovery of the year. Yeah, just a, some great job rushing right there, but it was the nose guard, EJ Speller right there, that came in, got a right paw on that football and knocked it out. And boy, I'll tell you what, these Wofford defenders are coming now. They better get that ball out of their hands or there's gonna be a lot of this here today. The Speller gets the force fumble and the fumble recovery. And the Wildcats uh, were moving the chains, but they give it up. Used to call that the triple play, the sack, the strip, and the fumble recovery. That was a great play right there by Speller. The hat trick, huh? <laughs> There's an end around. A lot of black jerseys, and up over the 50-yard line is Will Irwin, the Richard freshman from Lando Lakes, Florida. Yeah, just a nice look. Any way they can get it, they're going to find a way to trick you up here a little bit. And this is just a reverse right here to Irwin. He had some good blocking downfield, some great vision right there. You see his offensive lineman blocking downfield. And, and that's what's so tough against this Wofford team is you think they're just coming with a triple option, triple option, and then they pull a play like that out. It just always got you on your heels. Irwin only seven catches in this offense. That's his ninth carry. He's averaging almost 13 yards per carry. Breitenstein. You know, Breitenstein was, what, 5'11", 225. Not only great vision, but great balance as well. Huh? He really does. And when we saw him yesterday, just a real thick-legged guy. You know, just a guy that he's hard to get your arms around if, if you're a defender out there. But the, he really does a good job, again, with the vision, but just breaks the tackles. And like that run right there, nothing really fancy about it, but he just gets the job done. Look, and that's a seven-yard game. Second down and three. Breitenstein over the century mark already here in the second quarter. 109 total. There's the option near side. And run out of bounds. Uh, that's Octavius Harden, the redshirt freshman from Conover. That was the best job New Hampshire's done all day of playing that triple option. 
Nick Cefalo did a good job of staying home and coming up, flying up and tackling that pitch man. Run out of bounds, shy of the first down marker, 12.38 to go before halftime. It's gonna be third down. Third and about two, or maybe a yard and a half uh, for the Terriers. And uh, the give once again was to Harden, and he's gonna be stopped shy of the first down as the Wildcats were not fooled on that play. No, they weren't, but it looks like there's no thought right now of bringing on that punt team or that field goal unit. They're gonna go for it for fourth down the second time already here today. Yeah, the first time resulted in a 52 yard touchdown. <laughs> Why not try it again, right? <laughs> Terriers 11 of 18 now, converting fourth down so far in this 2012 season. I don't think he's gonna get it. He's not, and because of Matt Evans right there, came off the offense's left side right there, blitzed that gap, and made a big time play stopping that fourth down. Awesome play by that linebacker right there, Evans. Matt Evans, the senior, fifth year senior from Hanover. Last year's Buck Buchanan Award winner for the best defensive player in the FCS. 7 0, Wofford on top, but New Hampshire gets the ball back. Right. Back in Spartanburg, 7-0 Terriers on top, but this time they turn it over on downs. Yeah, they really did, and I'll tell you what, it's because of a big-time play again by Matt Evans. We'll see on the replay right here. Calvin Cantrell, the left tackle, is supposed to get him, but he's just too fast. Blitzing that gap right there, a run-stopping blitz called right there by John Lyons of New Hampshire, and what a big play right there. An ACC title and a place in the BCS Bowl game is on the line tonight on ESPN. Senior quarterback E.J. Manuel and the Seminoles of Florida State look to punch their ticket to the Orange Bowl with a victory over the Yellow Jackets of Georgia Tech. The Dr. Pepper ACC Championship game, Florida State, Georgia Tech tonight, 8 o'clock on ESPN and also live on Watch ESPN. 7-0 Wofford on top of New Hampshire. The Wildcats uh, with the football coming in averaging about 37, 36 and a half points a game. Still looking for that first score. They were moving the chains the last possession as Velas uh, gets the call and they throws it back to Go Goldrich. Well, how about that? And there's number four again, the CNO, Alvin CNO. He was not fooled at all. He was. That play looked like it started to have some, but CNO flew up right there and made a nice play. Again, trying to get both quarterbacks involved, but nice job by Wofford's defense, especially CNO. Again, not being fooled, staying home. Again, if you see that quarterback rolling out that way, he's doing it for a reason. And Bayless stays in the shotgun now, and Goldrich is back on the sidelines. Ceretti up over the 40-yard uh, line, picks up a couple, but it's going to bring up a third down. 
That's the only problem with trying to go with a trick play right there on first down. You wind up losing a couple, and now you wind up with a third and long type situation, which is tough. Again, these Wofford defenders can now just pin their ears, ears back and get after the quarterback. Wildcats just one for four on third down, coming in at 50% on the year. Bayless has uh, three wide receivers to the top of your screen, and he's going down. He had no time to even look downfield. Wow, number 57, Mike McCrimmon, the junior from Center Hill, Florida, was in there like a bullet. And I don't think they expected that play at all right there. Usually they only rush four, but right here on this play, they bring the middle linebacker, Mike McCrimmon, who's unblocked and comes right in there for the easy sack. It doesn't get much better than that, but again, I think over the course of this game, it's been all four-man rush, four-man rush, but right there, they drop that middle linebacker and it created a big play. Not only the uh, Cats change quarterbacks, now they're changing punters. Brad Prasky, a sophomore, He's averaging 44. Heavy rush gets it off. It's a low line drive kick. Nosek is tripped up immediately at the 33 yard line. Inside 10 minutes, defense, the name of the game. It really is. This Walford defense is on the prowl on the attack right there. Again, Mike McCrimmon with a big play. <laughs> And this fan wasn't lying he is on ESPN three as so is uh, Rontina McCann. Rontina? Coach Ayers told his team they cannot stop our offense, but we're stopping ourselves. He is trying to rein them in and get into the end zone again. Starter Brian Cass has been warming up on the sideline, guys. He's been nursing a hip pointer, so that's why we sometimes see him in these games this season, and he's out right now, but maybe he's the spark they need. Well, Rontina, five of the last six games, they uh, they say the big play has been missing. Of course, they got that big 52-yard run by Breitenstein. And here's the uh, pitch to the outside. And uh, once again, number 46, Hayden Nutson, a true freshman. He's already played a pretty good game defensively. Yeah, he really has. And this secondary's got to play well. Again, they got to come up and be a force in this run game. Can't just be Evans. It can't just be Busby back there. It's it's Asim. It's Safalo. All these guys, Trey Williams, we haven't called his name yet, but he's got to have a big time factor in this game as well. But uh, the other side of the coin, they did pick up six, so it's second and four. So nice gain on first down. Lawson, nowhere to go, and uh, he's brought down by uh, Manny Assam. A junior from Bloomfield, New Jersey. And again, that was just perfect assignment football. Somebody had the dive, and right there, Asim was on the pitch. He's the second leading tackler on this New Hampshire team. He came into this game with 64, had top five tackles for loss and an interception. And again, he's got to be a force in this run game here today. Now Wofford faces a third down, and uh, like New Hampshire, they are also one for four, converting third downs here this afternoon. Give it to number seven. He'll get you a first down as Breitenstein rumbles down inside the 45 to about the 42-yard line. Exactly. You're right. If you're in a short yardage situation right there, give it to your best player and make him 
makes something happen. That's exactly what, what he did. Right there, just takes it. They got the pull right there by the big left guard, Tamiko Gregory, and he just followed him again, just using that great vision, breaks a couple tackles. How many times have we seen that play right there today, Mike? Well, we're gonna see it a couple of more times. I'm <laughs> sure think, we will. Afternoon's over, 125 yards already for Breitenstein, who comes in averaging 150. He gets the uh, call again and wiggles his way down to the 40-yard line, picks up a couple on the play. We mentioned the 321 that he ran for Rocky. That is a conference record, but it's still not a Wofford record. John no. Graves ran for 323 at one point. Yeah, they got a great history of, uh, of, of the run game here at this college. 127 yards off today already. Most of them on that one long touchdown run. Second down, there's a pass and it's complete. Out to the uh, outside and the ball comes loose. And New Hampshire has it. So the Terriers have coughed up the football, fumbled, and uh, they fumbled twice after the completed ball, and it's not that often they complete passes around here. It really isn't, and that's probably why they don't try many times, because what's the old saying? Two things can happen, three things can happen when you pass, and two of them are bad, and that's what happens right there. That ball comes out on the first pass play of the game. Looks like it was Asim right there, getting a left hand and popping that ball out, and then that's a great job right there. Credit Nudson right there, following that ball before it went out of bounds. It was Rob Green who had had the reception and then coughed it up. Wildcats go back to work. They keep it on the ground and uh, breaking to the outside is uh, Setian. Chris Setian's a junior. East Long Meadow, Massachusetts, uh, averaging over six yards a carry. And Sean McDonald, the New Hampshire head coach, talked about it. If they can get to ready into the open field he is deceptively fast he is really good got a high end top speed on the back end here if they can get out in some space he can beat you now here's harris speaking of getting in space he tried that time but he's uh, driven out of bounds by uh, josh holt a junior from fayetteville georgia he tried the quick pass again right there again i like the call but uh, credit this swarming defense a whopper right there getting two guys out on the perimeter bringing him down Third down and short now as we take a look at the early numbers now fumbles turnovers both coaching staff says turnovers will be key in this game third and short now out of the gun empty backfield. Goldrich has the first down up to the midfield stripe he's brought down by Alvin Nassiano again. That was a great job of vision right there by Goldrich that play was designed to go in the right a gap but he saw it was clogged up took it to the left and got the first down. That's great vision by him. Steretti. And he's inside Wofford territory. He's gang tackled. Again, number four, CNO's in. Yeah, and they pulled both the right tackle, Bauman, and the and the tight end, Ciccone, on that play. But Steretti just got out in front of them and said, heck, I'll take it on my own here and got a couple yards out of it at least. Looks like he's feeling uh, some pain going off the field there. They say he is exceptionally fast once he breaks into the open field. Hasn't had a chance against this Wofford defense yet. Goldrich over the middle. It's complete and drops. Brian Ciccone. Now keep in mind, folks, that Harold Spears who has four touchdowns at the tight end, a tight end that can stretch the defense. He's out with an injury. Yeah, he really is. That means Ciccone is going to be the guy. And that was a seam play they ran last week, and Ciccone caught it for a touchdown. But that time right there, it was wide open. He's got to find a way to hold on to that ball. But like you said, it was a big-time loss with Harold Spears not being in this football game. They lose the ability to stretch the field. Third and about eight, five wideouts for Goldrich, working out of the gun. Harris has the ball. First down, he's inside the 35. R.J. Harris. And he fit this ball into a tight window. They dropped seven back into coverage. And McCrimmon right there looked like he was surprised R.J. Harris even caught that football, but a great job of him getting first down. Sadian tries to power his way to the 30-yard line, picks up a couple on the play. Getting back to R.J. Harris, uh, he's had eight 100-yard career games, and he's only a sophomore. Yeah, I, I think he has uh, some, I think we're gonna be hearing his name for a long time again, like you said, only a sophomore. He was all ACC first team, 18th nationally in receptions per game with 6.64. He gets it done. 
New Hampshire, of course, uh, they've had some big name players that have played for the Wildcats as Goldrich goes back to pass. This one's hanging up there. It's going to be picked off. CNO. CNO dropped at the 32 yard line, but Alvin CNO has his second INT of the season, and Wofford has the football back. Yeah, he had one last week, uh, kind of like that. Just the ball happened to fall in his hands, but he was Johnny on the spot on that play. It looks like one of those big defensive linemen got a paw up and knocked that ball down before it really ever got out of his hands. Actually, it wasn't even a hand, it was the helmet of Tara Godum right there. Bounced it off his helmet right in the hands of Ciano. You know, it's, it's about being in the right place at the right time. He definitely was right there on that play. And James Lawson, the sophomore from Pickens, South Carolina, remains at quarterback for Wofford now with 5.25 to go before halftime. Both teams averaging in the 30s as Lawson wants to call a timeout. Didn't like what he saw. Both teams averaging in the 30s, and we're still stuck at 7 0. So I guess it's true. Offense will sell some tickets. Defense wins the championships, huh? Yeah, it absolutely does. Both these teams got to find a way to keep holding on to the football. Too many turnovers in this game. <laughs> Back in Spartanburg, 7-0, Eric, the star here, Eric Breitenstein, of course, 3,100-yard uh, games, make it 31, we're still in the first half. Well, he has 10 rushes for 129 yards, and they've all been like that one, up the middle. He's just drowning out those hard yards, and again, I can't tell you how demoralizing it is for a defense. If you've got a guy that is just counting you up the middle, like Eric Breitenstein is, he, boy, is he doing a great job of it here today. That was the long touchdown that got them on the board first. 31 100 yard games. He had 125 against South Carolina. He and Jeremy Hill of LSU are the only two backs to go over 100 against South Carolina this year. And uh, Breitenstein, one of the uh, three finalists this year for the Walter Payton Award. I'll tell you what, I think he's going to have a hard time beating Taylor uh, Heinicke on that one. He has had a great year. Again, setting the, the career passing or total offense record with 791 yards in a New Hampshire game earlier. That's my pick for you, Ward. If it means anything. You get one? <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> All right. 5.25 to go. And to keep it uh, on the ground, Breitenstein hit at the line of scrimmage. Forward progress probably gives him a half a yard, maybe. I'll tell you what, defensively for New Hampshire, one guy we haven't called a lot is Alan Busby, number 54. He's another linebacker who's a real dynamic playmaking guy. I haven't called his name much. I'd like to see him get more involved in this game because they need his presence up the middle. Yeah, when you have Matt Evans uh, with 449 career tackles and yet they say Busby is the defensive leader, that's quite the compliment. He sets the defense for these Wildcats. So let's give Breitenstein another yard, maybe at second and nine. And Breitenstein is off to the races again, up over the 45, dropped at the 48-yard line. And, and I'm just shaking my head right now because at the offset of that play, it looked like that was stopped for no gain, and he just finds a way to squirt through right there. Good misdirection right there. You see Matt Evans overflows to the right, 
And again, just a great vision by Breitenstein right there. Just sees those linebackers over pursued just a little bit, cuts it back across the grain for a nice big yardage gain right there. Another first down uh, for the Terriers. Inside four and a half minutes now here in the first half. Here's the pitch and they go wide. Nosek and Nosek gets run out of bounds just inside New Hampshire territory. And Mike, it really hasn't been on the perimeter of the field that Wofford's really done a lot of damage. And we were talking to head coach Mike Ayers yesterday. He thought that the perimeter was where they were going to have a lot of success, you know, especially with those linebackers, Busby Evans being in the middle. But on the contrary, it's been up the middle. Those A-gap runs that have really punished this New Hampshire defense. If it's 7-0 at halftime, I don't want to talk about moral victories, but is that a victory for New Hampshire against this defense right now, or this offense? I, I think you could call it that. Again, you don't want to go against a, a team that controls the football like Wofford does. You don't want to go down two scores. So I think uh, if they can get this game in the latter stages, I think that would be somewhat of a moral victory for him. Breitenstein gets the call. Not too much running room. Matt Evans uh, was there to meet him. Along with uh, Shane McNeely, McNeely, a sophomore from Whitehall, Pennsylvania. Wofford already with 215 yards rushing on the day. And that's their M.O. Most carries they had uh, this year in a single game was 69, where they piled up 590 yards on the ground against Western Carolina. Lawson will pitch. Breitenstein will pick up the first down inside the 40-yard line, all the way down to about the 36. And again, if you're facing a triple option, it's assignment football. Someone's got to be on the dive, someone on the quarterback, someone on the pitch. And right there in that play, no one had Eric Breitenstein on the pitch. And that was it when they enabled him to get that big long gain right there and pick up the first down. Breitenstein came in with 1,653 yards, a three straight 1,000 yard seasons. And I think it's safe to say he'll probably go over 200 here this afternoon. Johnson gets the call. You, know, you talk about Breitenstein, but Johnson last year had 967 yards, so he was 33 from 1,000, and of course, Breitenstein went over 1,000 himself. Yeah, and Donovan Johnson, he, he actually leads in yards per carry. He has eight yards per carry coming into this football game, so again, a lot of these rushers getting the job done. The stable of backs for the last three years, at least one game, they've had three 100-yard rushers for the Terriers. Uh, 220, clock is running. Lawson near side reads keeps it and he's going to be stopped shy of the 30 yard line. That was a great job right there by Manny Asim right there. He kind of slow played that quarterback a little bit making him think he was going to go on the pitch. The quarterback kept the ball. He was still right there. Had good body position kept his shoulders and body square to the line of scrimmage and able to bring the quarterback down. Great play. Yeah, Sam uh, number two tacklers with 64 coming into the ball game, but I guess uh, with Evans 115. <laughs> you know <laughs> number 52 is going to be around the football. Yeah, most of the time. It's hard to pick up tackles on this New Hampshire defense. Breitenstein right up the middle. And looks like he's going to pick up another first down for the Terriers. Yep, they're moving the chains. They've got a minute 32. They stopped the clock to move the chains, but the uh, Terriers trying to punch in one more touchdown before halftime. There's a man down. I'm sure they're just another run up the middle right there. They pulled the left guard. Got some positive yards. It looks like it was Manny Asim who's down on the field right now. Hopefully for New Hampshire, he is okay because, again, he's played a big-time presence in this game already, and they need him. We already talked about he was the second-leading tackler coming into this football game. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier in the broadcast, too, that John Lines, the defensive coordinator, saying that uh, Manny Asim has to, has to make an impact. He has to have a big game. He, he really does. Again, it, it just just can't be the linebackers. Can't be Matt Evans just having come out of the game with 15 tackles. When you're facing a triple option, a lot of guys, secondary players, got to be a presence in that run game. So Sam uh, comes in from the left left side of your screen. He's number four. And we'll see right there. I don't know if he got a hmm. either got a quad injury or a hip or something like that versus the pulling guard. Looked like it was T.J. White. 61 right there may have clipped him a little bit in the hip or something but it didn't look like it was a knee or an ankle or anything did it mike it looked like yeah. it was maybe just some sort of a it looks a like hip he's holding his arm like a wrist or an elbow yeah it's really hard to see what exactly happened right there maybe again maybe just the helmet of tj white either clipped him in the hip or in the hand or something but it looks like it'll be okay 
So Sam leaves the field. His backup. It's Tim Pike. They go with that 4-2-5 defense. Option. Top of your screen, Yeoman gets the call. And Yeoman's inside the 15-yard line. The senior. Yeoman just off the injury list and back on the field. He really was, and I'll tell you who made that play right there. It was number 39, Brad Nosek. He got out, he does a great Anthony, job as a blocker. Goal, first down. We'll see right there. Flips the ball right there, but we'll see right there with a, you see him just out of your screen right there, Nosek with a great block. And then right at the end there, we'll see the penalty. It looks like it may have been a horse collar penalty right there. Yep, and we'll see right there, Evans with the horse collar tackle. Tenth play of the drive coming up, Rocky, right here with a minute 17 to go before halftime. Lawson works out of the gun. Breitenstein has his 64th rushing touchdown of his career. And Mike, I don't know if he was even touched on that play. It was, uh, again, just some of that misdirection type things with the quarterback and the pitch, but uh, again, it was Breitenstein up the middle. Goes right in for the easy touchdown. You played big time linebacker. You got a Super Bowl ring. I mean, how do you read that? Breitenstein's the big ball carrier. You, you got to figure he's going to have the ball more times than not, at least. You do. And my, my philosophy at this time is you know what? We're going to let someone on this team other than Eric Breitenstein beat us. You can't just let him run up the middle. Again, it's just such a, a, a horrible feeling when you're getting the ball run up the middle on you. And if I'm a the defensive captain, if I'm Matt Evans, if I'm Alan Busby out there, I'm saying, look, someone is going to beat us on this football team, and it's not going to be Eric Breitenstein there. Well, Redfern's uh, PAT hits the upright as Breitenstein uh, gets into the end zone again. Untouched. Untouched. Unbelievable. 18 times he's done that this year now, and uh, 64 times in his career. One more, and he will tie Armadi Edwards of Appalachian State, who's now a member of the Carolina Panthers. And you can see already today he's having 16 rushes, 169 yards. That's his second touchdown, getting his 31st career 100-yard game. And, you talked about trying to get that moral victory for New Hampshire. What's well, not going to happen? They just got an 11-play drive, took up a lot of clock, and now it looks like they probably, unless they put something together, are going to go down into halftime, down 14. Let's check in with Rontino. Well, we've seen a lot from Eric Breitenstein, and Walford has had their eye on him for many years. How about this? He grew up just outside of Boone, North Carolina. His brother played for Appy State. His grandfather was actually an interim coach there. So you would think it'd be a gimme in Boone, but not so. He wanted to walk on at Clemson or South Carolina, but then opted for the scholarship by the school that courted him the most consistently throughout high school, and that is Walford, of course. He's doing pretty well here. Everything works out for the best. 125 yards against South Carolina a couple weeks ago. Graduates in two weeks, guys. Well, that's interesting. Huh? Appalachian State with all the success they had, too. I guess uh, you want to make your own mark in the world, so you got to give him credit for that. Uh, Storetti is up to the 20-yard line. And a good open field tackle at that time by Wofford. And that was uh, Nick Crocker, redshirt freshman from right here in Spartanburg. That was a great play. But, yeah, I think you're right when, talk, when you're talking about Eric Bridenstein. I think he just wanted to make his own legacy. And, he, boy, he sure is doing it here at Wofford. And I think that's so important. I tell high school kids, high school players, you know, what college should I go to? Go to the place that is just in love with you the most. And I, and I think if you follow that philosophy like Eric Breitenstein did, I think it always usually thought, works out for the best. I thought Lloyd Carr in Michigan was Yeah, they like me. They like me pretty good, yeah, but <laughs> not, not enough. Okay, all right. Those, no, those gold helmets for Notre Dame love me a little better. What were you uh, <laughs> against Michigan? What were you at Notre Dame? What's that? What, what was your record against Michigan at Notre Dame? We never we actually played in my freshman year and lost, uh, uh, beat them my freshman year. Well, Goldrich showing some athleticism. Uh, should have been another sack. Uh, Wofford already has four of those. And, and uh, Goldrich finally gets rid of the football. John McDonald, former uh, New Hampshire graduate. Again, they, yeah, they just rushed four right there. And again, just the pressure in his face. And just credit Goldrich for finding somehow some way to not get the sack or even worse, a safety right there on this play heading into halftime. Inside a minute now, just 58 seconds to go before halftime. Four wideouts for Goldrich. Fires top side looking for Harris, and he underthrew him at the 30-yard line. Would have been a first down if he pulled it in. Yeah, and Goldrich has got to find a way to put that ball in. He was wide open right there. R.J. Harris would have caught that ball and got out of bounds. 
But instead, now you're looking at third and ten. I mentioned some big names at New Hampshire. We mentioned uh, Harris going over a thousand. How about David Ball? He had three 1,000 yard seasons when he played for New Hampshire. He was a great player. Of course, uh, Ricky Santos, his quarterback, uh, won the Walter Payton there. Goldrich right down the middle. This one's uh, complete, and it's good for a first down as Joey Orlando has another catch. Joey Orlando, the coaches talked about yesterday, probably the best hands on the team, real student of the game. He's been the best receiver for New Hampshire so far this year. Working quickly now, Goldrich goes down the middle. This one's picked off. Mike Nyam has his first INT. And Goldrich never saw him right there again. They tried the four vertical routes, the seam route right there. He's trying to hit Sacconi going down the middle of the field. But just a nice job by Nyam right there. And again, Goldrich didn't even see him. He's trying, didn't even see him. Boom, jumps up right there. Just a great play, great vision right there by Nyam. We'll talk about how the kind of career Mike Nyam has had. This guy, give him a lot of credit. He's had two ACL injuries since he's been here at Wofford. He's always found a way to come back. And just a great story, great heart and determination on that kid. Lawson puts it up. And he had his man, but it's uh, dropped as Cam Flowers almost uh, had his uh, first catch. Yeah, and that, that was, I love the call right there. Trying to go into the halftime rather than just trying to rush it out there try to go for the big play and that, that's the thing with Wofford they throw in just enough passes where you got to keep you know keep you honest a little bit and they almost had a big one right there and you mentioned Niam I mean uh, he missed four games this year and still made the second team all conference so a lot of respect around the league Lawson goes upstairs has his man inside the 35 yard line and uh, that one was uh, complete to Jeff Ashley, who has his 15th catch this year. Yeah, he's the leading receiver, if you want to call it that, with only 15 receptions on the year. But a nice job. He ran the defender up the field, stuck his left foot in the ground, and came back on that square, and for a nice game. Uh, Casey Redfern, their kicker, he's only four for six this year because they score so many touchdowns, but uh, he does have a long of 53. So Lawson and company trying to get him in field goal range, uh, possibly here with 22 seconds to go. Of course, you want to give it to number seven. Maybe he'll break one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that uh, that's a big time consideration in the game plan right now. No question. Well, Lawson's uh, getting a chance to throw the football, but decides to run it instead. He's out of bounds uh, with 16, 15 seconds. Clock really should have stopped at 16 seconds, but they have 15 on the clock. That was a good job by him, but at least getting out of bounds right there had to tuck it and run it but at least got to that left sideline got out of bounds stopping the clock with 15 seconds I think they got a time for maybe I got to get what's third down in, in five right now they may just try to pick this thing up send the field goal unit out keep it on the ground Johnson trying to break it to the outside. He's pushed out of bounds. Helmet comes off with seven seconds to go. He's at the 21 yard line. How about the effort right there by Donovan Johnson. Breaking tackles relentless to try to get to the sideline and stop that clock. What a great football play by that young man right there. So this would be a 38 yard, 37, 38 yard kick if he gets it all. One tackle, two tackles, three, puts his left hand on the ground, staying up. And he even still got the first down and got out of bounds. Great play. First down, but there's only seven seconds remaining on the clock, and uh, the offense stays on the field. Reitenstein behind the quarterback gets the call inside the 20. Keeps his legs churning down to about the 16-yard line. And there's two seconds remaining on the clock, and now here comes the kicking team. Yeah, they used their last time out right there. That was great. Maneuvering right there by that offense put together a little bit of a drive good clock management They call a timeout with two seconds They'll bring the kicker on here to Try to add three more before they head into halftime So Casey Redfern a junior from Jamestown, North Carolina four for six in field goals this year will Come on and try to uh, make this a 17 nothing game at halftime Well you go back to 2000 uh, Wofford is 18 and one against non conference competition only last game against Coastal Carolina back in 2006, uh, trying to make it 19 and one here 
this afternoon, then take on the winner of that North Dakota State, South Dakota State game. They'll kick that one off at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Mike Ayers, the four-time Southern Conference uh, Coach of the Year. And Wofford, they've had some close calls. So we talked about that 7-7 tie with South Carolina this year, but uh, some of those numbers kind of tell the story. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, if you're a rushing football team, you're always right in that game. They control the clock well, and if they can get it down in the last part of that game, they like their chances. Last year, the Clemson game, 35-27. Uh, they led that game in the third quarter against Clemson. Mentioned 7-7 against South Carolina. Of course, they lost that game as uh, they turned it over three times, three fumbles. Yeah, they were in that game until the fourth quarter, but the turnovers came up and bit them. They may have come out with that game. Ball spotted at the... 24 it's a 34 yard field goal and he missed it yeah it looks like it went wide right on him so redford uh, 0 for 3 from that distance uh, this year and ironically he's 2 for 2 from 40 to 49. it's going to be the final play 13 nothing as you check out the numbers rocky 297 total yards for wofford <laughs> some teams would love to have that for the entire game they have 275 on the ground just at halftime have really been getting it done and again it's been up the middle I'll tell you what New Hampshire's going in at halftime right now and John Lyons a defensive coordinator for New Hampshire has got to say look guys we've got to stop the up the middle run let's go downstairs and check in with Rontina all right thanks guys I was just talking to coach Ayers off camera about Brian Cass and his status and you said he might come in the second half but you guys are moving the ball so yeah. uh, Brian's ready to go we started with James uh, and uh, He's been he's been doing a good job, and we we've just kind of kept him in there. Uh, we've had opportunities for a lot more points, and, and we've wasted too way too many opportunities. Uh, we've got to get better at uh, at finishing, quite frankly. And uh, this team is an unbelievable football team. They can throw it all over the lot. Uh, again, defensively, we're we're playing an unbelievable game. We need a, another great half out of the defense, and then offensively, we need to take care of the ball. All right, thanks, Coach. All right, thanks, Ron Tina. Halftime here at Gibbs Stadium. Score, it's 13-0 Wofford on top. The BCS season's wrapping up. When we return, BCS Countdown gets you ready for this year's College Football Awards, and then takes a look at last week's top five plays. Halftime, around the corner. Spartanburg, Eric Breitenstein has had plenty of room. 173 yards rushing, 13 nothing Wofford on top of New Hampshire. Mike Leeson along with uh, Rocky Boyman, the former Notre Dame and uh, Super Bowl champion linebacker. And, uh, you know, of course, Breitenstein stole the spotlight. But New Hampshire, they've moved the chains at some, but they keep turning the football over. If they don't do that, they're, they're in this football game. No, you're absolutely right. They've turned the ball over three times, and that's kind of been the difference. And, again, Mike Ayers talked about it going out of halftime there, kind of giving up more opportunities. They could have even more points on the board. So New Hampshire's definitely in this football game. They've got to get that offense going and capitalize here in the second half. And as we take a look at the first half highlights, no surprise, number seven gets the call on fourth down here. Well, yeah, exactly on fourth down. He scampers 58 yards for his touchdown. They've got them on the board first, and he has had a lot of success up the middle. We talked about him before the game he's definitely had an impact but talk about impact these corners right here Wiley right there with a big time play and then the criminal with the big sack right there four sacks and then right there Whoppers put the ball on the ground some as well too New Hampshire coming up with the ball right there but then EJ Speller with a triple play sack strip fumble got the ball on top gave it back to his offense and they definitely took advantage of it. What stands out to you more than, uh, let's say, maybe the four sacks? I'll tell you, the time of possession right there, you look, it's over four minutes in favor of Whoppers. They've definitely gone, which is their MO, which is control the clock with the running game. They've definitely done that. But talk about the defense for Wofford. Look at their four sacks right there. New Hampshire, them defensively, come up with a couple strips. Matt Evans has had a couple big plays. But again, they've got to find a way to stop that run up the middle. Alan Busby, some of those guys got to step up and be a big part of stopping that Wofford rushing attack. And of course, the Terriers are plus one in the turnovers and both coaches said turnovers will be a key and Wofford's up by 13 as we check in with Rontino. And on that same theme, I just now talked to the Wildcats head coach, Sean McDonald. He says they need to hold on to that football, and when they get it, they need to establish the run. That is what's missing in their game right now. They're getting pushed around, need to be tougher up front on their offensive line, do a better job on defense as well, and tackle. So he's not happy that it's only 13-0. They've held them. He says that they're getting run, ran all over. And Wofford uh, up by 13 will get the football first here in the second half. And uh, 
Well, they're going to run the football, of course, Rocky, but you look at some of the shadows down there as we look down on Gibbs Stadium. It's going to be tough for some of the receivers to see the football if they're going uh, right to left. No, you're absolutely right, but I don't see Wofford uh, abandoning the run game at all, especially now with the lead. That's what they do is run the ball. I think we're going to see a lot more running out of these Wofford Terriers. That sun is bright, and uh, New Hampshire, of course, will be going right to left as they open up the third quarter, but Wofford gets ready to uh, receive the kick. Mike MacArthur is ready to kick off the second half. The winner goes on to the quarterfinals. Wofford up by 13. And it's taken at the 10 yard line by Ray Smith. The penalty flag dropped all over the field. It's a flag, and usually that area of the field means a holder blocking the back. Legal block in the back. Yep. Number 10 at the distance to the goal. First down. That's Quay Bell, the 6 1 sophomore from Miami, Florida, guilty of that infraction. And again, Rocky, uh, you talk about disciplined football. First down. You look at this uh, Wofford football team as far as uh, penalties though 4.7 penalties less than five penalties a game. That's that's pretty impressive. No, it really is and that's the old adage Tony Dungy when I played for him always talk about that teams that don't beat themselves most often win and that's one thing Wofford really does a good job of taking care of the football and protecting on offense. Well Breitenstein 173 yards we mentioned in the first half as high as 321. He's had a couple of 200 yard games. And I'm interested to see right now what New Hampshire does, what they talk about at halftime to try to stop this rushing attack up front in the middle. Well, Breitenstein gets the first call, and New Hampshire is waiting for him. He just hits the line of scrimmage, maybe picks up a half a yard. You see number 54, Alan Busby, who said we should mention his name. Well, there it is, Alan and, Busby. And I'm sure John Lyons, the defensive coordinator, got all over him at halftime and said, look, young man, step up and start making some plays right there. But already I see a little bit of an adjustment by New Hampshire. They got... The safety, Keith Parkinson, number 33, is in that box. You see him at the bottom part of your screen in the second level. He's got to be a big factor in stopping this run up the middle. Lawson uh, pitches. No sick. He's got some running room up over the 20, all the way up to the 25-yard line. And uh, it's good thing number 46 was there again. Nuts and Hayden Nuts, and the true freshman makes another tackle. And again, no, nothing we haven't really seen the fake up the middle than the pitch right there. And just a great block right there by the wide receiver, allowing Nosek to get a few more extra yards. Safalo, I stand corrected. That was a Nick Safalo. My apologies. The sophomore from Basking Ridge, New Jersey, made that tackle. But the uh, Terriers get yet another first down. Johnson in motion. Option far side loss and keeps it over the 30 up to about the 33 34 yard line. And there's a Sam again with a nice job stretching feathering that play out there a little bit and coming back and tackling the quarterback. Lawson uh, the sophomore from Pickens, South Carolina going the distance as Rontina told us Brian Cass the usual starter at quarterback has yet to play and uh, Michael Weimer who you spoke of the redshirt freshman. Uh, out of South Carolina yet to play as well and after this this play we'll talk more about that uh, freshman Weimer when he plays quarterback you mentioned he broke off a, a big one this year you go back to the Western Carolina game Weimer when he got to play first offensive series he broke off a 54 yard touchdown then the third series he broke off a 73 yard touchdown wound up with 141 yards at quarterback on six carries. Yeah, he, but, but he injured his knee a little bit in the last game they played versus South Carolina. But it looks like that extra week off uh, was a blessing for him, and he was able to get that thing healthy because he looks pretty good here today. Third down and short. Five for eight, third down conversion so far for the Terriers. They started one for four. There's some movements. Wofford's pointing at New Hampshire. New Hampshire's pointing the other way. False start. Number 85, off, five yards, third down. That's Michael Harp, uh, the junior tight end from Spartanburg. Guilty of some movement, uh, so they move back instead of third and short. Now it's more like third and six. In New Hampshire, they finally got a break right here. They need to take advantages and keep them back. Don't get in a fourth and short situation. Don't want to get in fourth and one, because even in this area of the field, you never know. Wofford may go for it. So 26 yards already for Wofford. And penalties on three penalties. Here comes Lawson with the pitch. Wow, the fumbles on the carpet. And this is going to be a defensive touchdown. And Cody Muller, the junior from Telford, Pennsylvania, 
And Mike, I'll tell you what, it was Alan Busby, the guy I called him out, flat called him out on the air right here, and somebody must have heard because he just came up with a big time play right there. Came up from his linebacker spot and stripped it. Watch him right here, you see number 54. Boom, big time, perfect textbook tackle. Got his face mask on that football. New Hampshire picks up, goes in for the touchdown, and what I say before, they needed a game-changing type play, and they sure got it right there. They are definitely back in this football game. Wow. On the board, on for the extra points, uh, Mike MacArthur, the junior from Northampton, New Jersey. Well, he kicked that uh, pretty confidently, and I say that uh, because he's very lethal on field goals, so not so lethal on extra points as we take another look. He's just great linebacker player right there. As a linebacker, you're defined not by the tackles you make five yards down the field. It's the ones you make behind the line of scrimmage, and there's none bigger than a play like that. We'll see again, just tracks that football. Look at it, puts that helmet, perfect tackle, textbook tackle. And then with his player right there, his teammate picking the ball up, rushing in for the touchdown, Cody Mueller. Great play, and that is exactly what Sean McDonald, I'm sure, talked about at halftime. Guys, we are in this game. We just need somebody to step up and make a big-time play, and, man, they sure got it. Well, whatever the message was, they listened at halftime as we uh, take a look at the season re recap. New Hampshire out of the uh, CAA, or the Colonial Athletic Association. Old Dominion actually uh, won the conference championship. And uh, these guys finished uh, six and two. And the biggest stat right there we see at the bottom is red zone scoring third in the FCS, 94%. But they haven't been in the red zone at all today so far. But uh, when you're getting big time scoop score touchdowns from your defense, who needs it? Smith at the 11-yard line this time for Wofford. And he's hit and hit hard. He's smothered at about the 17. And, Mike, it always takes one big play for your team to start playing more inspired football. And I saw that right there by New Hampshire. They came out. They were flying down that field in that kickoff. And just a great coverage play by that special teams unit. So you look at the uh, fumbles right now as uh, Wofford lost three fumbles. And now we're even on the uh, turnover departments. The Wofford uh, gets possession with the lead 13 to 7 now. And they want to come out throwing. And it's uh, complete. He was 3 for 5 throwing the football. That's Ashley again, as you mentioned, the leading receiver on the team. Pulls it in. Yeah, and this is just a, a quick option play. They saw the corner Houston playing off right there, but credit Houston was sticking his foot in the ground and come up and making a great open field tackle. Anytime that quarterback sees that defender, that corner playing eight, ten yards off the ball, he's going to throw it. A corner has got to be able to tackle when you play off like that. Great play. Wofford 5-0 and oh at home this year. But we'll see if uh, Big Mo shifts over to New Hampshire now. As the Tigers keep it on the ground. A lot of white jerseys around the football. They're playing with a lot more confidence against that option. Yeah, you're definitely right. And again, I just think they're a little bit energized again by that big play by Busby and Mueller on the series before. And that's exactly what they need. See them right now waving their hands to their fans trying to get this crowd in the game. See the long hair by Busby right there looking like Clay Matthews. <laughs> making plays like Clay Matthews out there. Well, they need to stop now on third down if they can force a punt and get the football back. Lawson. Keeps it up over the 25. Uh, had to get to about the 28-yard line for the first down. And depends on the spot. He's going to be shy by about a yard, yard and a half. Yeah, Nudson, the safety right there, came up and put a face mask on that running on the quarterback right there, and I think stopped it. Ah, well, they gave the good spots. And yeah, give him a first down. That's a questionable spot, Mike. Don't you think? It looked like he was definitely shy of that first down. Yeah, I thought for sure that uh, he came up short. But a brand new set of downs for the Terriers now is 10:44. Uh, very quick first half with Wofford running uh, the football so often. Breitenstein right up the middle. Breitenstein inside the 30-yard line. You know he's coming. You know he's coming right up the middle, but you can't stop him. Exactly. And again, how frustrating is that? You know he's going to be running that ball in those A gaps right there. And they shifted the defensive line at the last second right there. But through that offensive line, look at that hole right there. He could drive a truck through it. And Eric Bettenstein hits the truck. He took advantage of that big hole his offensive line opened up right there. And again, New Hampshire is starting to get some momentum, starting to get back in this football game. What happens? Eric Bettenstein does what he's done all year with a big time run. He had the 52 yard touchdown in the first half. He scored twice. He went 45 on that one. And remember, he had uh, 173 in the first half, and he gets the call again. 
And there he goes. Touchdown, Breitenstein, number three on the day. Again, just deceptively fast up the hole, breaks a few tackles and punches in the end zone. I mean, how many times can we say it? It's, it's just, you know it's coming and you can do nothing to stop it. Terrible feeling right now. And New Hampshire has got to be shaking their heads. They've got their hands on their hips out there. They're wondering what the heck just happened because they were in this football game with that play. That's a 65th career touchdown. On for the extra points. Redfern missed the last one, but he's good this time. Well, Rocky, 246 now for number seven. Yeah, he, he's been this story all day. You saw it got a big time pull right there by Tamika Gregory, the guard, and then it's just Breitenstein the rest of the way. Another touchdown for number seven. Twenty to seven now is Eric Breitenstein. Breitenstein's gone from fifth to third now, all time in Southern Conference. Well, I'll tell you what, he has just gotten it done on the ground. This is the first half touchdown run on the opening series of the game. And it's been all number seven up the middle, and right there, we'll see. This is another big time run right here. He takes up the middle for another long game, and then just a touchdown, getting some great blocks by his offensive line. They have really done the job for him here today. Three touchdowns, 246 yards. For more on uh, the star running back, let's check in with Montina. Guys, this is the third straight playoff appearance for the Terriers. Five of the last six seasons, they've made it to the postseason. But Eric Breitenstein says that that's not enough anymore at Wofford. The standard is making the playoffs. They want to go deeper. They still have all their goals at the beginning of the season intact. They got a piece of the Southern Conference title. They're in the playoffs, and then they want to end their season in Frisco. Their coach says the seniors play consistent and disciplined enough with enough will and passion that that could happen. Yeah, Breitenstein, he'll be there because he's a finalist for the Walter Payton, but he wants to bring his whole team there. He wants to bring the whole team, exactly. Just an unselfish guy, a guy that, you know, it's always hard to get something out of him. He never wants to talk about himself, but, uh, again, just one of those guys, if, you know, if you had a daughter, you'd want him to go out with a guy like Eric Breitenstein, just a good young fellow. Breitenstein, uh, as I clarify, he's gone from fifth to third. His 65 rushing touchdowns ties Armani Edwards, so third now in the Southern Conference history. Scaridi takes it at the 11 yard line. And Scaridi trying to get past the 20 to no avail. He's swarmed on by a bunch of black jerseys. And that's where the Wildcats will start. Inside Gibbs Stadium, Spartanburg, South Carolina, the uh, home of the uh, Wofford Terriers. They're 18 and one since 2000 against non-conference competition. Right now they lead at 20 to seven. Mike Leeson along with uh, Rocky Boyman and Ron Tina McCann. Great to have you with us as the winner moves on to the quarterfinals in this championship race. Looks like they're going to stick with Goldrich here at quarterback. And they keep it on the ground and up to about the 22 yard line. 
with number 90 making uh, the stop again as you take a look at the total yardage now as Wofford moves up to 388. And it's tough to win if you're giving up 388 yards to a team with just over uh, into the third quarter here. They've got to find a way to stop them better. But they're coming up with a big play, and now they need the offense to finally put something together. Haven't been able to get much going here today so far. Inside 10 minutes, uh, quarter number three here from Spartanburg as uh, Goldrich fires it out in the flats and is setting it. Another nice uh, open field tackle that time by Wofford. That's uh, Kendall Bratcher. I think he would have had a little bit better chance right there if his wide receiver Justin Mello had blocked the right guy. But again, Bratcher right there came up with a nice play. Good open field tackle. You've got to love a cornerback that can tackle in the open field. Third down play now for the Wildcats. Third and about seven yards to go. Here we go, third and long. Those guys are pinning their ears back. Here they come. Five wideouts for Goldrich. Uh, that was a play from the get-go. It's going to pick up the first down. You know what? I really like that call right there. Again, it's third and long. Those guys are trying to get upfield. Use their speed to their advantage. Watch. They get too far upfield, and the offensive line just kind of washing by, and Goldrich just a nice job, great decision, tucking it and running. Up-tempo offense now, too, as they keep it on the ground. The Sudian, uh, the junior from East Long Meadow, Massachusetts. Uh, it's a lot of resistance at the line of scrimmage. <laughs> Josh Roseboro, number 90, he is providing that resistance. He has had a tough, great game here so far, controlling that line of scrimmage. One guy for Wofford we haven't talked a lot about is Tarek Odom. He's a big time dynamic playmaker, number 99. We'll see if he gets involved in this game here. <laughs> Harris uh, with the end around up over the 40 yard line. And had to get to the 44, or just shy of the 44 for the first down. A good job by Harris getting to the corner. Yeah, there's Tarek Odom again. He's a 600-pound squat guy. My great lower body, only five foot ten, but he uses that leverage to his advantage. He has four and a half sacks on the year, six and a half tackles for loss. He reminds me a lot of Dwight Freeney, you know, who's also a short guy, but tremendous body control, gets low. He gets underneath the pads of those tall offensive linemen. Well, Florida State was looking at him as yeah. a fullback. But uh, once he got on campus here, he just uh, loved it here in Spartanburg on this Walker campus. Third down and short. A little dancing and depending on the spots, good penetration by that Wofford defense. Uh, yeah. There's Mike McCrimmon right there, number 57, did a great job attacking the line of scrimmage right there, and it's going to be close. We'll see what the spot is. I just mentioned Roseboro. Now Josh Roseboro's down on the field for the Terriers. Roseboro, a senior, a speller, only a redshirt freshman, and Odom, only a sophomore on that defensive front. Yeah, they got some big bodies up there. I'll tell you what, EJ Spellers had a big game so far. He had that sack strip, fumble recovery. Roseboro's made a lot of plays. Hopefully that young man's right. Looks like they're working on the right leg, maybe an ankle or a calf or something. South Carolina, number one in the Southern Conference against the Rush. Number one in scoring as yeah. we take another look at the injury. Yeah, we'll try to see what happened right there. He does a great job. He just got a little bit low right there and you wonder if the if the the foot or something maybe just kind of got underneath him and, and hurt an ankle or an Achilles or something like that. I mm -hmm. uh, just kind of got a little bit too low on that play. Lost his leverage, legs a little bit too wide. Got the job done though as McCrimmon came up to make the stop. He plugged that hole, but it's going to be a costly loss as Roseboro, eight and a half tackles for loss, three sacks uh, coming into this game. Mm -hmm. You see, those are national numbers there, but uh, in the Southern Conference, just 17.7 scoring. That's number one in the Southern Conference. And number one against the Rush. And Skiridi hasn't really had a chance to break one. The coaching staff saying when this guy can, he can take off. Yeah, he really can, but he hasn't really found a way to get to that second level where he can utilize that speed and that quickness. Again, credit this Wofford defensive line. That was Mike Nyam right there with a good tackle. Velos. The sophomore quarterback back on the field now, replacing uh, Sean Goldrich. Empty backfields. Skiridi in motion, but uh, Bayless wants to run it. Boy, look at that tackle. Huh? Another open field tackle. 
Again, it's uh, Stefan Shelton, the cornerback. We've seen about four or five great open field tackles here. And as a former defender, there's nothing I hate more than that a cornerback that doesn't like contact, doesn't like to be forced in the run, but these guys are not those type of corners. Shelton right there comes up in the run game, aggressive, stops a big play before something got started right there. They pulled a couple offensive linemen, may have had, may have had something going there if not for Shelton. You know, Rocky, New Hampshire, they average about 33 passes, so these guys are reading their keys, doing a great they job. They really are. They're reading their keys and doing a good job, but uh, looks like another Wofford defender injured on the play right there. We're going to take a timeout as New Hampshire faces a third and seven when we come back. Inside seven minutes, uh, the Terriers on top 20 to seven over the Wildcats. Wofford losing uh, two of their star defensive players up front on the same series. Yeah, in, in, in three plays, they've lost two of their best up front guys, Rosenborough earlier and then, then Tarek Odom right there. And it's going to be guys like that. Zach Murphy going to have to step up big without their two best defensive ends in the football game. And there's the other one, Leverett mm -hmm. Diggs. He's going to have to come up big as well. Maria Jr. out of Avon Lake, Ohio. Uh, Diggs out of Pittsburgh, also a junior. And there's some good penetration. As McKernan gets in there in a hurry. That's five sacks now for these guys. He had that looked like the exact play he had a sack on earlier in the first half. Again, usually they rush four. This time they rush five, and no one picks up Mike McCrimmon. So that's either on the quarterback, he's got to get that ball out of his hand, or someone, a running back, Sadie and Sarid, has got to find a way to pick him up. Five sacks for Wofford. Uh, it's going to give him 25 now on the season as uh, Brad Prasky, the sophomore. He's on the punt at about the 25 yard line. Gets it off. It's a short one. Uh, Nosek uh, stays away from it and it goes out of bounds. So Wofford will have a decent field position when we come back. Inside of six minutes, 20 to 7. Terriers. Remember the winner moves on, loser goes home.
This telecast is copyrighted by the NCAA for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this telecast or any picture, descriptions, or accounts of the game without the NCAA's consent is prohibited. 20 to 7, now Wofford on top of New Hampshire as we check in uh, with Rontina. We're updated on that injury. Actually, two injuries. Defensive linemen getting their right ankles retaped. Josh Roseboro and Tarek Odom both have the same thing going on. They're going to retape the ankles, let them walk around on it. And the trainer says that they probably will be able to go back in. See Roseboro right behind Rontina. She almost took right me out now. there, Rontina. <laughs> Looks like he's moving okay. Maybe not 100%, but. Uh, he obviously wants to get back in as we take a look at that Wofford defense. They have really put on a show here today. They've been the story in this football game, them and obviously Eric Breitenstein. James Lawson has gone the distance so far at uh, quarterback for the Terriers. But now Brian Cass gets his first play at quarterback as the Richard Jr. from Raleigh. The usual starter is dinged up and now he's running things for the Terriers. Yeah, we didn't really think, uh, as Mike Ayers talked about at halftime, didn't think we were going to see much of him, but here we see him. Maybe they just want to get him some reps and make sure he's ready if they are do, in fact, advance in the next round. Comes in with 103 carries on the year. He's only thrown it 43 times throughout the season. It's 18 of 43 for 345. Six touchdowns. He has five rushing, but only 42% throwing the football. But he can run. And there he goes. Finally knocked out of bounds by Manny Sam. But Brian Cass has the big gainer for the Terriers, and they're threatening once again. Yeah, they are. Well, they finally did a good job of tackling the dive right there, but unfortunately, this is what happens when you face a triple option. Look how hard that is. He looks like he rode that thing down there really good, very deceptive, and took off on the long run. Looks like he may have been dinged up a little bit on his right arm. Looks like he's going to come back out of the game right now. And Lawson goes back in. At least Cass not only gets to wear the uniform, but gets to break a sweat, and he picks up 33 on that play. This is Johnson. Johnson's down uh, near the 17-yard line. Yeah, and I think it's important they get Donovan Johnson going because look, if they want to advance into the you know second, third, and fourth round of these playoffs here, they're going to need both these running backs. And we talked about Donovan Johnson, eight yards per carry coming into this game. He can get it done. It's important to get him going as well. Remember New Hampshire in that last the loss to Towson. It was 30 to 28. At halftime, they trailed by two and they got blown out in the second half. And now Wofford, if they score here, as New Hampshire comes up with a nice uh, defensive play. Cody Muller uh, making the initial contact and the tackle there for the Wildcats. On Cam Flowers, another redshirt freshman. This Wofford team, as successful as they are, they've got a lot of young players. They do, and it's important to have depth, especially in the playoffs. How many times have we seen at every level, teams get in the playoffs and their starter goes down, they don't have an answer. Got to have a lot of guys with experience if you want to go far in the playoffs. Third down play now for the Terriers. Right up the middle, and uh, they'll be facing a fourth down, but they are in field goal range just outside the 15-yard line. And you wonder right now, do they, you know, it looks like they are going to Go ahead and kick this thing. It's important to get your kicker going, get him some confidence. Obviously, this game is by no means in the bag, but with 20 to 7, the way they've controlled it, looking pretty good. I like the call right here, go for the field goal. Paul Inclan, the junior, will spot the ball at the 23, a 33 yard kick for Redfern. And it's good. So they don't get the seven, but they add three more on the board inside three minutes. So time is definitely not New Hampshire's friend. And now we have a 23 to seven game. So again, the Mike Ayers are trying to get in that quarterfinals. So North Dakota State, South Dakota State will kick it at four o'clock in the Fargo Dome. And the winner of this game will meet, I'll take a wild guess and say North Dakota State at this juncture. Yeah, probably if South Dakota did upset though, they got the FCS leader in running. So they'll, uh, or excuse me, not the, yeah, the top running back, uh, Zach Zenner, he does a good job running the ball. There'll be a lot of rushing yards in that game. But uh, Georgia Southern obviously is a great team in the playoffs. Stony Brook's done a good job here so far as well. Appalachian State, some moments ago, they were down 14 to 10. Hard to 
to win in Boone against uh, the Mountaineers, but they trail in that game. And then Eastern Washington Wagner later tonight. 2012 NCAA Division I Championship will continue next weekend. Quarterfinal games. All games will be on the ESPN Family Networks. For more information, go to NCAA.com, the official online home for all 89 NCAA championships. Inside three minutes now, 2.57 to go, 23-7, Wofford on top. This one's uh, taken at the uh, five-yard line, and it's going to be Harris up over the 25-yard uh, line. Earlier, uh, Rocky, we talked about the great balance for New Hampshire passing for 237, running for 234. On average, uh, they run it about 40 times a game, throw it 33, but uh, with time not on their side, we're inside three minutes. We could see a lot of passing here in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I think it's going to be a lot more passing, but uh, either way, whether it's running or passing, they've got to find a way to get some offense going. Right now, they only have 148 yards of total offense on the day. Compare that, Wofford over three times at 431 yards. They've got to find a way to get some offense going. Wow, that's a great performance by Wofford. New Hampshire averaging 471. Goldrich sets up a little screen. It's already hurdles one, uh, but there's three more black jerseys. And number 57, McClendon, is having a big game defensively. Man, these Wofford defenders, they attack now. I mean, the guys are flying around, sticking their head in. If they miss the tackle, that's okay, because someone else is coming right up behind right there. I like the aggression right there by Shell. He shot his gun, missed the tackle, but stopped up. The wide receiver just enough, and there was two other Wofford defenders right there to bring him down. Yeah, if it's not number 57, usually number uh, two, Stefan Shelton, has been around the football all afternoon. Picked up maybe a yard on the play, so it's a second and nine, and this one's Harris. He's up over the uh, 35 for the first down. So that'll stop the clock as they move the change with two minutes and six seconds to go in quarter number three. And Harris, he's really been the only offense they've had so far here today. Just a nice job finding a spot. It was a zone defense, and credit him for reading that. Sat down right in that zone, picked up a nice game. Harris again tries the high step, uh, and again, another open field tackle. And who else but Stephon Shelton? Man, I really like this kid. He is explosive out there. No fear coming up. Shotting right there through the blocker, trying to get there. Pushed him out of the way. And brought down R.J. Harris. Whoever taught that young man how to read his keys did a good job. He really did. Third down and about 10 yards to go. Nowhere to go. Goldrich finally uh, lets go of it. Incomplete. It's going to bring up another punting situation. Or check it. That's only second down. I, I Staying corrected. Third down coming up right now, but Goldrich had nowhere to go. Yeah, he had nowhere to go. That was a covered sack right there. They had everyone covered up, and then you throw in the great press right there by Wofford. And just, uh, you know, if nothing else, a good decision by Goldrich, at least to throw that ball away and not take a big sack right there. But how many times have they been in this situation? Third and long right now. Now these Wofford defenders again are going to be coming after that quarterback. Look for Mike McCrimmon. He's been the guy on this third, third down play. He's blitzing up the middle. Five wideouts looking for Harris. And there's a little bit of bump, but incidental contact. And now it's going to be third down. Yeah, McCrimmon didn't blitz right there, but he was on the coverage. Did a nice job. Thought he might have got there a little bit early. R.J. Harris thinks he did. He's shaking his head right there as he walks off the field. But not a great throw at all by Goldrich and uh, a little bit of frustration on the part of New Hampshire right now. Frustration here too. I meant to say now it's gonna be fourth down. <laughs> I forgot Harris had picked up that first down, but now it's fourth down and still 10 yards to go. No six standing at the 20. And the Brad Prasky, the sophomore, he's punted all afternoon. Usually MacArthur does the uh, punting and this one goes out of bounds. His last punt was only uh, 20, he came in averaging 44. Well, if the New Hampshire offense can't get anything going, the defense has got to find a way like they did earlier to step up and make a game-changing type play, an interception, a forced fumble, something. Somebody out there has got to make a play. You see head coach Sean McDonald right there. He's an old ball coach now. We enjoyed talking with him yesterday, and he's trying to keep his troops rallied in this football game. 2005 Eddie Robinson, National Coach of the Year. Ayers also winning that award. Nine straight NCAA postseason appearances. 
Tell you what, a stat that goes against them, though, they are one out of their last 10 in December football games. So that's not a stat you want to have in your column right there. This time it's uh, Johnson up over the uh, 40. And Johnson moves the change for the uh, first down. Yeah, Donovan Johnson's more of the slasher right there. We see does a good job. But how about this offensive line just getting after these guys right there? We see Calvin Cantrell providing a good block. This offensive line, four out of five of them are all conference offensive linemen. They thought the right guard, TJ White, was a little bit overlooked. He did not get all conference. He had 135 knockdown blocks this year. You know, Rocky, you talk about New Hampshire with the nine straight years in the postseason. Now, there's some good penetration. Uh, number yeah. 90 coming on the uh, the left side. That was Jared Smith. Now, there's another guy we haven't called his name a lot, and he's one of their best defenders, probably the guy with the biggest NFL next level type potential. Six foot three, 292 pounds. He's a leader in tackles for loss, gets his 10th on the season right there, but uh, he's got to be a little bit more of an impact with some more game changing type plays. Now Smith, the senior bowl watch list, the one of four from the CAA compared to 71 players from the SEC. So that's quite the honor for Smith. And uh, we played the three quarters. So we have 15 minutes of football left, uh, 15 minutes, and the victor moves on and the loser goes home. Right there, that was a big time. The only big play New Hampshire's had in this football game. They need more of those here in the fourth quarter if they want to get back in this game. NCAA.com is your online destination for college sports. With comprehensive video highlights and editorial coverage of FCS, Division II, and Division III football playoffs, along with soccer, volleyball, cross country, and field hockey championships across all three divisions. NCAA.com has extensive coverage of your favorite schools and your favorite sports this fall. NCAA.com, the home of college sports. As we head for the fourth quarter, Wofford on top, 23-7. And Rocky, I don't know what impresses me more, that Wofford running game or their defense. They're holding a, a team that averages 470 yards, uh, less than 200. Yeah, they're about 160 yards of total offense right now. And just that attacking defense by Wofford. I saw them against South Carolina getting after them. The South Carolina's first two drives, they had three sacks, a forced fumble, and interception. I said, wow, these guys can play defense. And they sure are showing again here today. 
You know, Rocky, you go back to the old adage, it's never over till it's over, as uh, Yogi Berra would say. But uh, what do they have to do right now to get back in this game? I, I think it's all about the big play at this point. They cannot find, you know, it can't be a steady moving the ball down the field. They need some quick strike ability. They need that defense right now to step up and stop them and maybe even force another turnover. Lawson with the pitch near side. No six got some running room and he's. Well, he's horse collared at the 45 yard line, so that's uh, going to go against New Hampshire. Now, you mentioned the nine straight trips to the postseason. New Hampshire, and the, as far as the uh, Play. top 25, they've been to the top 25 for 125 consecutive polls. Yeah, well, here's the play right there. The problem is they had two guys on the quarterback right there. Nick Cefalo right there came, came up with a tackle, but again, they had a, two guys on the quarterback. One guy had the pitch. Okay, great, but they need a guy that got to come up a little bit, a little bit faster, a little bit quicker. And now you throw on 15 yards with the unsportsmanlike conduct, and it's just been a bad news day here for New Hampshire. You played a lot of football, and I understand the safety factor, but the horse collar, I mean, sometimes <laughs> you just got to get that guy. I'll tell you what, it's hard to play defense in football right now, whether college or NFL. It's just uh, these guys are moving fast, and you, when you start thinking about how you got to tackle someone instead of just tackling them, that's, uh, that's a whole other ball game. It's tough. So the carry at uh, that time goes to Octavius Hart and the redshirt freshman from Conover, North Carolina. So we've uh, seen four, five, six backs already here for Wofford. And of course, uh, the big back, number seven, uh, Breitenstein, over 200 yards uh, again. 321 is his, his career. I don't know if they're going to save him now. He hasn't been in on the last couple yeah, of Yeah, you know, and it makes a lot of sense. I was just looking out there. He hasn't been in a lot, but uh, you want to keep some tread on the tires on him because if they're going to win, they need him in, in the second and third round of these playoffs. Harden, nowhere to go. He's uh, wrapped up. Uh, that's Alan Busby. Nuts in on the play as well. Busby hasn't made a ton of plays today, but everyone he's made has been big. That was a great job of running right there, showing his speed, getting to the perimeter on the sideline. They need a guy like him to make some more big plays if they want to get back in this football game. So the Terriers facing a uh, third down, third and ten now from the 30-yard uh, line. They lead it in the game, 23 to seven. And there's going to be eight. Play game on the offense. Five yards, third down. Second time we've seen that. Uh, first play of the game. It went against New Hampshire. <laughs> yeah, but this is a little bit more excusable right here, uh, being in the fourth quarter. That when, when you open up the football game with a scripted play and you take a take a penalty on that, that's uh, not something you want. But uh, that's one of the few things that Wofford has done wrong today. Here, they've done some a lot of things right. Wofford had the 13 to nothing lead at halftime and then New Hampshire got on the board with a defensive touchdown and but the Terriers are just controlling things now but uh, they're trying to do something about that as uh, number 60 that's Matt Kaplan breaks through and makes the stop behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah, it was a nice job by Kaplan breaking through that line right there. He has three sacks on the year but that was a great tackle for loss he had on a third down play. It's now fourth down. It looks like they're going to go for it. It's kind of in that in-between range where you don't want to punt it, but it's a little bit too far of a field goal. So I like the call. Saw Jared Smith walking off the field right there. I don't know if he's injured or if it's just that his helmet came off and he's got to sit out of play. Fourth down and a long way to go. Fourth and 15 now at the 35-yard line. Lawson. And he's going down. That's going to go down as a sack. And uh, yeah, that was Cody there. Moeller. He had the big touchdown earlier, but now comes up with a big time fourth down sack right there. Moeller gets his fourth sack, and now it's up to their offense to get rolling. 12:25 to go to get back in this ball game.
Back inside Gibbs Stadium in Spartanburg as we check in with Ron Tino. Eric Brightside isn't the only one who has a potential in the NFL who's playing in this game. We also have Jared Smith. He is a defensive lineman for New Hampshire, and he is on our Todd McChase radar. The ESPN draft analyst says that he expects Smith to go as a late-round pick. Also on his who to watch in the playoffs, Stony Brook running back Miguel Masonette, Old Dominion linebacker Craig Wilkins, and a pair of corners as well. Thanks, Ron Tina. The uh, Southern Conference had three players taken in the 2012 uh, NFL draft, uh, the most of any FCS conferences. Appalachian State's uh, Brian Quick went to the Rams. Uh, he's averaging about 19 yards a catch. Uh, Playing very well. Mm -hmm. uh, eighth in tackles uh, for the Saints, and B.J. Coleman is on the uh, Packers practice squad. It's kind of tough to make that squad when they only keep two quarterbacks, and one is Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Seretti, so Buck. Over the 45-yard uh, line. That was Josh Ro Roseboro. Looks like he's back healthy, back in this game with a big-time tackle. One last thing about Jared Smith. He also has three block kicks this year. He's a force. Tough guy to block on extra points and field goals. Second down, Harris uh, gets the call. Loses the football. And the reason he lost that football is uh, really uh, number three, Blake Wiley, the cornerback, the other cornerback, busted through. And Harris had to try to juke him or go around him, and he just lost control. They have really been the story today, haven't they, Mike? Both those corners, Stephon Shelton, Blake Wiley, both of them are very productive here today in the run game. Blake Wiley also getting it done as a pass defender, six pass breakups, the leader with two interceptions. And they have really been the story of this football game. Again, I love watching aggressive, playing cornerbacks. So now it's third and about 11 yards to go. Bayless works out of the shotgun, empty backfield. Boy, he's looking down. Coverage was good because he's looking and looking and his feet were moving and finally finds his man. Great job of finally getting down to the 40 yard line by completing it to Zaccone, the big tight end. Yeah, just credit him for keeping that play alive right there. And they brought Mike McCrimmon off the edge right there. Usually they bring him up the middle. They brought him off the left side right there, but this time it's picked up and Bayless just keeps this play alive. I mean, that's a, it's tough to cover for that long for that secondary, but right there, Kurt, Brian Sacconi coming up with a great, great reception right there. Picked up 21 and the first down. Storetti gives it up. And we're going to see some razzle dazzle. And this one's going to fall incomplete. Uh, that was Joey Orlando throwing the ball. And, and, and Wofford was not forward on that play right there. The free safety, James Otto, number 11, stayed home. Great job. They, they sent something was up right there. The wide receiver kept going upfield. Great pursuit right there again by Wiley. And it was covered up. Great job staying home by that second. Row. James Otto, he's another guy that these players thought was a little bit overlooked for all conference. Just a smart player, not a super dynamic playmaking guy, but always in the right spot. And he was there again. Bayless to get out of bounds to stop the clock with uh, 10.57 to go in the ball game. Here's Alvin Ciano. He's been a big time player in this game. Mike McCrimmon, the other linebacker. They really run this 3 4 defense to a T here. Really do a good job. And it's those linebackers and ends that really get after the quarterback, apply a lot of pressure, make a lot of big plays. Wildcats, 7 for 13. They open up the game 1 for 4 on third down. Interesting formation at the top of the screen right there with three wide receiver stack. Baylor steps up, fires, had his man open and threw it behind him. That was Allison. Jared Allison uh, was open at about the 28-yard uh, line. Yeah. And I think Allison was uh, thinking that ball was going to be thrown a little more toward the sideline. It looks like they're thinking about going for this play. And at this point, what do you got to lose? Well, down 23-7, 10-33 to go. You're at the 40. Walker's going to call a timeout right here. Sean McDonald, 14th year, former defensive back, 75 and 76 when they were with the Yankee Conference champs. They trailed 23 7.
John McConnell facing a fourth down. They trail in the ball game 23-7. You see 10-33 to go in the game. And uh, Rocky, what do you call here? Well, I'll tell you what, with the way the pressure that Wofford's been able to apply with five sacks today, I think it's important to get the quarterback outside the pocket. I think you've got to roll Goldrich or Bayless outside. And then they, they, after that, you got to start looking for R.J. Harris or Joey Orlando. Those are your two big-time wide receivers. But they have not been able to protect well on third down today. I think you've got to get him outside the pocket. Sedians in the backfield, so four wideouts. Bayless, wow. Heavy pressure, by some time. Penalty flag drop, throws it into the end zone, and it falls incomplete. Again, penalty flag back at about the 47 yard line. Well, they got outside the pocket, but not by design. And, and again, that's why I thought they had to get outside because with the pressure they brought. Holding. Number 78 of the offense. The penalties declined. First down, Walker. That's Rob Bowman, a sophomore from Connecticut. Yeah, and just the hold right there. Again, it was Tarek Odom. It looked like, yeah, he just grabbed a little bit with the on the breastplate right there. But again, that's why you like to get the quarterback outside the pocket. If your offense of line cannot block for you, you've got to move the pocket, get outside, sprint outs, roll outs. And I think that's what they should have done right there. And you see what happens when they don't. Well, Bayless actually did a pretty good job staying away from Alvin uh, Ciano. Ciano, number four, came busting through there in a hurry. So now the Terriers uh, have the football with uh, 10 23 to go, and they have the lead. And nowhere to go for Lawson. And. Boy, a great uh, job sniffing uh, that one out. Yeah, that was number 55. That was Jay Colbert. Yeah, Jay Colbert's first time we've called his name today, but that was a great play. Staying on the quarterback, that was his assignment. He took him down before he could pitch that ball. Second and 13. Johnson somehow gets up over the 45 yard line. It's, and it's going to make it a manageable third down. You just got to love the way these running backs, whether it's Johnson, Breitenstein, they just keep their legs turning after contact. That's something you, you really can't teach, but they got it for sure. You see so many backs, even, even great running backs, will stop their feet after contact. These guys keep those legs turning. Thought about this uh, ball control offense right after this play. Third down play. They keep it right up the middle. Johnson's not going to make it. You know, Rocky, of the 53 scoring drives, only 14 have been 10 plays or more. Only 10 have lasted longer than five minutes. Uh, that's a little bit uh, surprising considering how well they move the ball on the ground. You'd think there'd be longer scoring drives than that. Yeah, it really has. But, I mean, look here today, two long touchdown runs by, by Breitenstein. So they kind of chip away. But... They've done a good job of also breaking some long ones. It's Donovan Johnson. We talked about uh, the fact that he was 33 yards uh, shy of a thousand last year. He's been dinged up a little bit. But as Rocky pointed out, still averages 8.8 .8 yards per carry. And uh, clock is running 824. And they're going to give up the football with the lead. Heavy rush. They wind up getting off a good punt. And good coverage. So the Wildcats, they trail, and they have a lot of green in front. They have a nice job on Michael Harp. He's usually a tight end, but a great job rushing down right there on that punt coverage, giving his field great possession. So nice job by Redford on the punt, and good coverage as well by Harp.
Well, New Hampshire uh, facing a 23-7 deficit has the ball inside the five-yard line. But, Rocky, let's go back and uh, take a look at uh, some of the big plays of this ball game, starting with Breitenstein with a big fourth down. Yeah, he's really been the story. Uh, this is the fourth play of the game. He scampers for a 52-yard run. Then his second touchdown right there. This is his third. This one, a 26-yard touchdown run. He has really been the story, carried the load for this offense. But it's the defense of Wofford that's really stepped up. There, Sino with a big interception. They also have five sacks on the day. And another interception by Nyam. This is the only play really that New Hampshire's had to get going all day. Their only score came on that sack strip right there by Busby, picked up by Mueller. And the, again, that's their only productive play so far. And now they're faced deep in their territory. They're going to have to go on about a 98 yard drive here, Mike. Yeah, Wofford held South Carolina under 300 yards, uh, but the coaching staff in New Hampshire has to be somewhat shocked. That a football team averaging 36 and a half points uh, stands on a defensive touchdown, and that's all they have. As you look at uh, the numbers uh, so far, Wofford 13-0 uh, at halftime, and now with the 23-7 lead, 7.1 yards per carry. And that's really been the story. That's a huge, huge number right there. 7.1, usually on average about three and a half. If you hold a team to three and a half, you're playing good defense. But 7.1, you are not playing good defense. And uh, Scaritti gets the call shy of the 10-yard uh, line. Uh, the junior from Tom's River, New Jersey. He has five 100-yard games this year. And against Old Dominion, he rushed uh, for 201, but he just hasn't been able to break away from this uh, Wofford defense. Yeah, and again, it's that defensive line. We talked about it coming into this game, how big of a force they were, and they've really lived up to the task here today of not letting those New Hampshire running backs get into the second level, keeping them contained. They've really done a great job. We approach the seven minute mark and it's third down for Wofford or for New Hampshire rather. New Hampshire that's Harris. Harris has the first down. I was just about to ask you the last time we saw him go for fourth down but they were inside Wofford territory. If they hadn't completed that ball do you go for it or you punt it away? I think you got to punt it away at that point. But uh, unfortunately for them, for them, they don't have to make that decision. But uh, good job. They brought a little pressure right there. They brought the safety off the edge. Offensive line picked it up. Quarterback delivered the ball to R.J. Harris. Goldrich uh, fires to uh, Harris again. Harris with another uh, completion up over the 20-yard line. R.J. Harris only a sophomore. He had only two, only two catches against Towson. Three games prior, he had seven for 88, eight for 131, 10 for 77. So he's been uh, productive in this game, but uh, he's one of the lone bright spots. Yeah, he really is. The only real bright spot on offense. And, and a lot of his catches have kind of come over, over the middle right there, which is okay in, in the early part of this game. But right now, Wofford's defense say, look, we'll give you that four or five yard catch. Just milk the clock on out. Harris, a 10 for 72 so far. And uh, Goldrich is going to throw it again. Wow, he threw it behind his man. That was Justin Mello. And Mello, he knew if he caught that one, he was going to get hit. Yeah, he heard the footsteps a little bit, but uh, you got to put that on the quarterback, Goldrich, a little bit. He's got to deliver that ball. He got a wide open wide receiver in a in a playoff game. You got to get him that football. If he leads them, he probably had some yards. Yeah, after he had the some catch. yards after the catch as well. Good job of getting open. You just got to deliver the football when you get the opportunity. So it's second and ten. Nice hole on the right side, and they're up over the 40-yard uh, line. And that was uh, Jimmy Owens, uh, the sophomore. Mentioned uh, him during the uh, coaches' conference calls, but that's the first carry for Owens here this afternoon. See these linebackers, the safety's creeping up there. Siano, bring four. Again, the antenna receiver was mellow, and again, this time a little bit too far in front. And you got to wonder at this point in the game if that pressure, those five sacks that you know that Wofford has put on his on the quarterback here, Goldrich, if he's starting to just affect him a little bit mentally, he's kind of getting rid of that ball a little too soon. He had a little more time to put his back foot in the ground and deliver that football. But again, when you're facing pressure like Wofford's ball day, that's always a tough task. Another fourth down situation, fourth and short though. Ciccone, the tight end, moves to his right. Setian picks up the uh, first down, fights his way out to about the 44-yard line. So they pick it up, and, you know, they're putting together a couple drives here, but uh, look, at this point in the game, this is exactly what Wofford, what Wofford wants to do. Just give up the five-yard play, milk that clock out. They're playing a lot of too deep. Just don't give up anything big over the top. 
corner blitz that time. They pick it up nicely and uh, they complete that ball up to the midfield stripe. And Wofford thinks that ball might have hit the ground. Joe Orlando's had a few catches here today. He's usually the red zone guy, but if unfortunately New Hampshire's not found his way into the red zone at all today. Yeah, they've been prolific uh, so far this year in the red zone, and there's pressure again. CNO and Vela somehow gets away from him, and uh, Harris pulls it in for another first down. And CNO is sick right now. He had another sack, and looks like he may be a little dinged up on that play. But credit Vela for getting away, avoiding that rush. But they cannot afford to lose. See, you know, he's been a dynamic player. And I'll tell you what, it, we, Todd McShay or no one's really mentioned him in terms of next level NFL stuff, but he's only a junior. But I got to think next year he'll be uh, on that watch list. Six foot two, 215 pounds, can run, got great hips, always find himself around the ball. He's a good player. This Wofford defense says so far this afternoon, we've seen pressure on the quarterback, aggressive play by the cornerbacks. Um, Good play by the linebackers. A very, very impressive performance by this Wofford defense. It really, it really has. It hasn't been just one area of that football team. The defensive lines played great. Linebackers all over the field. And again, those secondary players, those corners are very formidable in the run as well. Again, the uh, winner of this game will take on the winner of North Dakota State and South Dakota State. Uh, Georgia Southern was beating Central Arkansas. And uh, Old Dominion is uh, taking on uh, Coastal Carolina. Montana State to Stony Brook tonight at 7 o'clock to San Houston State currently uh, taking on Cal Poly and Illinois State Appalachian State and Boone uh, going at it right now and the Eastern Washington Wagner later tonight and with uh, Wofford with this game pretty much in hand they're rooting for South Dakota State because if they win they get another home game they would like to do that rather than travel to the Fargo Dome in North Dakota that's always a tough place to play. Old Dominion uh, winning the CAA with a 7-1 record. New Hampshire, Richmond, the Villanova, Towson all finishing at 6-2. As Davis wants to go deep for the big ball, and he had his man. And Mello, this time it was light in there, and he couldn't pull it in. He really didn't. How about the recovery speed by Blake Wiley, number three, the cornerback? He was beat right there. He had Mello deep. And the ball hung up just a little too far in the air, but look at the recovery speed right there. At the last second, finds the ball in the air, puts his right hand out. I cannot tell you how tough of a play that is right there. But Blake Weiler, we talked about him in the run game today, that time making a great play in the secondary. It's a 12th play of the drive right here for uh, Bayless and company as he spins his way up to the 40-yard uh, line. So the uh, Wildcats averaging uh, 36 and a half points. They're 94% in the red zone. They have yet to taste that red zone. <laughs> they need to find a way to get in. If it's going to happen, it's going to be on this drive. Bayless, plenty of time. This time over shoots his man. And the intended receiver was Joey Orlando at about the 25 yard line. And you can kind of just tell, I mean, New Hampshire, if they're forced to throw the ball, that's not really what they do. You know, the, the quarterback play has not been a very efficient, whether it's Goldrich or Bayless. Haven't done a good job of living the football with the wide receivers. And uh, again, Walker has pretty much got this game in hand at this point. Another fourth down play. And I would get the quarterback outside the pocket here. We'll see what they do. Try to find Andre Harris, Mello, Orlando, one of those guys. This could be the game set match right now for the Cats. Bayless goes down. Probably a second late to getting the football to Joey Orlando. He was open inside the five yard line. What a great play right there by James Otto. He was a cover two safety right there. That ball hung up a little bit, and he had the speed to get to the outside part of the field right there and knock that ball at the last minute. 420 to go. Andy Bayless, Joey Orlando, James Otto. On the spot, 23-7, Wofford, and now they can eat some clock.
Mike Ayers has the lead and the ball as we check in with Rontina. Hey, thanks. Mike Ayers is the longest tenured D1 coach in South Carolina. I talked to his staff as far as what makes him so good and have such longevity here, and they say it's because he's very hands-on. I'm not going to tell you who told me this story, but in Montana, they were there for a playoff game. It was raining. It was turning to snow, and they were trying to get the team back that night from the airport, and they didn't think the plane would take off on time. Could not find Coach Ayers. He was in the underbelly of the plane loading the luggage <laughs> and the equipment up onto the plane because he wanted to get home in time guys so definitely hands-on old school huh old school guy we enjoyed talking with him yesterday and uh, he had a lot of confidence yesterday if you recall he, he thought his team would really come out and play well and boy they sure have Mike yeah three of the last five years they finished in the top ten uh, I, I reminded him that I called their game in 03 here against the Western Kentucky and Western Kentucky was favored in that game, and uh, they scored an 80-yard touchdown pass on the first play of the game, and that was about it. And uh, <laughs> Coach Harris says, yeah, about the second series, they knew that they came to the wrong ballpark. <laughs> so he's very confident uh, in his, uh, his abilities and his team. Yeah, but... Uh... So a timeout on the field uh, with 4.14 to go. Kansas State's fantastic regular season comes to a close with a must-win finale in Manhattan. Colin Klein and the Wildcats look to secure a Big 12 title and the automatic BCS bid against uh, Case McCoy and the Texas Longhorns. Saturday Night Football presented by Windows 8, number 18 Texas, number 6 Kansas State. That's tonight, 8 o'clock Eastern on ABC. Boy, Colin Klein and Kansas State. I mean, uh, BCS is nice, but boy, they had that national championship. I know you're a... <laughs> but, I mean, that had to be heartbreaking for a Kansas State fan. You're right. They got to be absolutely sick. I remember looking at that game, and you circled that one saying, okay, Baylor gave up 70 points to West Virginia. Surely Kansas State and Colin Klein will come in and win this game, and they sure laid an egg. And, you know, Coach Snyder's got to be thinking what could have been. They played so well all year and then just uh, did not show up for that one. Former linebacker for the Fighting Irish, what were your thoughts when Oregon and Kansas State both go down on the same day? Well, I, I, my initial thought was careful what you wish for because, you know, if both teams lost like Oregon and K-State did, then you're looking at possibly facing Alabama, which turns out to be the case. And uh, But uh, or, I, I got or Georgia. Or, or Georgia. Georgia, no. I, I, and I, I've said earlier in the week, um, I, I think really think Georgia has a chance. They're a more of a veteran team right now. Um, their quarterbacks are one of the most efficient players in college football right now. So uh, I think they got a real chance, and they've got some momentum. Jarvis Jones, that linebacker, boy, he should be sure play. So uh, they're going to give Alabama all they got. So Wofford, I think it's safe to say we'll move on to uh, win the, uh, play the winner of that North Dakota State, South Dakota State game. Georgia Southern, uh, they've been to the semifinals. In back-to-back -back seasons, losing to North Dakota State last year. Look at Appalachian State in Boone, tied up at 31 with three and a half minutes to go. Yeah, they're in a slugfest right there. That's got to be a great game. And Appalachian State is so good in the playoffs. Illinois State giving them a run for their money. And North Dakota State uh, got a couple of touchdowns on South Dakota State. And we're back to live action here with third and eight for the Terriers of Wofford. And nice tackle on Cam Flowers as Flowers tries to uh, turn the corner. Yeah, that was Stephen Thames right there on the tackle. And one thing we didn't really mention, because it hasn't really been much of a factor, but uh, Don Trey Peters, their number one cornerback, surprisingly uh, did not play in this game, came out in street clothes uh, for the coin toss. Uh, again, must have been a little bit dinged up in the last game, but... Um, Again, uh, could have maybe been a little bit more of a factor in the run game, Dontre Peters. Yeah, Peters uh, nursing an ankle, ankle sprain. And, of course, uh, Wofford, uh, Mike Ayers, the winningest coach uh, in school history. And uh, to talk about icons uh, here at Wofford, that's Jerry Richardson right there, the owner of the Carolina Panthers. He played here, graduated 1959, went to the Baltimore Colts. And uh, people probably remember that... Uh, are of that age in 1959, the Giants Colts, Johnny Unitas hit the rookie Richardson with a big, big touchdown pass in the fourth quarter of that ball game. And it's a very proud man right there. He gets to bring his Carolina Panthers for up here to Wofford College for training camp. Such great facilities they have here. Number 51, uh, Sean Graves, uh, number one. The other side of that scoreboard also has his number retired. There's a fumble. And when it rains, it pours, as Redfin picks it up and gets the first down. 
like you said, when it rains and pours. Uh, you know it's your day when you miss a, a snap on a punt and somehow turn it into a first down. It's, it's been all off for today. And you see right there on the, on the snap, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Look like he just went to drop that ball to kick it and missed his foot with it. And the size just take off and run, picks up the first down. So you don't think they practiced that last week? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think that's, Mike Ayers does a lot of tricky things, but I don't think that's one of them. So a new set of downs uh, inside the 45 yard line now with 3.50 to go in the ball game. Brad Nosek, and he's hit at the 40. Forward progress uh, gets him inside the 40 to about the 39. And I think, you know, Wofford right now, you just talk about going into next week. Uh, looks like they're going to get out of this game healthy. You didn't see much of Breitenstein here in the second half because they did, really didn't need him. So they get to rest him again, keep some tread on those tires. You know, we saw uh, saw Odom go down. We saw Rosenborough go down both the defensive ends. Looks like they're going to be OK. They came back. So uh, it's important to get a big victory. Looks like they're going to come out of this game healthy and uh, looking forward to next week. And uh, I said they were going to eat some clock, and uh, Redfern, the punter, made sure that they get more opportunity to eat some clock. Still running uh, their offense. Looks like they, uh, Donovan Johnson's still in the ball game. Stopped at the line of scrimmage. So inside the three minutes, they're not exactly uh, eating clock per se. <laughs> they're trying to get some more points. Yeah, they're they're running their offense, and that's usually what these coaches say. Look, we're going to run our offense the way we do it. Try to get some clock, but if we can get in the end zone, that, that'll work too. Now the Terriers will move to 19 and one against non-conference competition here since 2000. They'll be six and zero at home so far in 2012, but. Uh, more than likely, we will hit the road, head up to the Fargo Dome to take on North Dakota State, last year's champions. And Lawson keeps it down uh, just shy of the 35 yard line as we approach the uh, two minute mark. And there we see Jared Smith. Looks like he's not going to be coming back into this game. He's going to play his last game. As a Wildcat, he's going to be looking forward to preparing for that combine or the new senior bowls, things like that, to try to get himself a spot in the NFL roster next year. Fourth down, but we're inside two minutes. Fourth down, a couple of yards to go. Lawson's gone, uh, I want to say the distance. We did see uh, Brian Cass on one play, picked up a 33 yard run, and no Nosek is going to get a first down. Looks like he got right to the marker and pushed back the forward progress, so should give him a good spot. Yeah, New Hampshire doesn't think so, but I, I think, like you said, his forward progress is going to give him the first down. So just a toss sweep right here to the right, he breaks a couple tackles. How many times have we seen that today? And look at the legs turn right there. I think, yeah, he got past that look. Yeah, they're setting the chains. First down for Wofford. Now they're going to take a couple knees, and that's going to be the ball game, Mike. Yeah, Nosek only had 18 carries uh, coming into the ball game on the season, but uh, he's been uh, productive here. You can see why he's averaging a 7.6 yards a carry. And that's important. Again, you get another running back on, getting him some momentum, getting him some touches. Can't emphasize enough. As you get longer in the playoffs, you need more guys. Guys start to go down, you get an injury, can't afford to let an injury ruin your season. They got a lot of depth on this Wofford team. faces on that New Hampshire sideline. They went out in the second round last year. This of course is the second round again. And Wofford will move on to the quarterfinals. Southern Conference, this will be their 97th win in postseason. And how about Breitenstein the day he had. Yeah, and he, I, I think he probably could have eclipsed that 321 he had if they would have kept him in the game. But I think it's a smart move. Gets a big time day, but they get to keep him, get, get a little bit of rest, and head into next week feeling very confident about their football team. But well, Breitenstein had told us yesterday he might get 257. He came awful close with the 246. Your final thoughts on the game? Now, I, I, I think you really got to like how Wofford's playing right now. Offensively, played great, established that run game, got a lot of players in ball, involved, but defensively, how about the way those corners play? Defensive line also applied a lot of pressure on the quarterback. Five sacks. They look tough here so far, Mike. Well, for Rocky Boyman and Rontina McCann and our entire ESPN3 crew, Mike Leeson saying so long from Gibbs Stadium in Spartanburg. 
South Carolina, final score, Wofford, 23-7. Watch this entire game on replay as well as other games on our family of ESPN networks. Log on to watchespn.com or download the Watch ESPN app. This has been a presentation of ESPN. So long, everybody, from Spartanburg, South Carolina.